your bloody prayed. Sharp knew it was true. What about you? I'd like the stripes back. Fried? Why not? They keep saying the Irish are fools, but I know there's precious few laughing at me. Well, that could be your size, not your stripes. Hey, maybe, but I'll not have them saying I failed. So, you've volunteered. Sharp nodded. Yes, but they won't choose anyone yet, not till the assault. And if they choose you, will you take me? Yes. He said the word with reluctance. The Irishman nodded. Ah, uh, let's hope they choose you, then. Pray for a miracle. Harper laughed. You don't want a miracle. They always turn out bad. He drank rum. St. Patrick turns out to all the snakes from Ireland and what happens. He gets so bored that we let the English in to take their place. The poor man must be turning in his grave. Snakes were better. Sharp shook his head. If Ireland were five times bigger and England five times smaller, then you'd be doing the same to us. Harper laughed again. Nay, that would be a miracle worth praying for. Guns boomed to their right across the river as the cannon in the San Cristobal fort fired over the Guadiana towards the parallel. The long spitting fire was reflected in the dark water. The gunners on the city wall, not to be outdone, fired their pieces, and the night was filled with the noise. Harper shivered with the cold. I'll pray for another miracle. What? A chance to get Hakeswell. He nodded towards the city. In one of those little alleyways, he'll tear his bloody head off. What makes you think we'll get through the wall? Harper gave a humorous laugh. You don't really think we can fail, do you? No. But then he hadn't really thought he could lose his captaincy. Hadn't thought he could lose the company. And not in his worst dreams had he ever thought that he would have to stand and watch Patrick Harper being flogged. The cold, wet night drummed on, bringing the bad dreams true. Chapter 16 Rain and more rain, increasing in vehemence, so by dawn it was seen that the river had flooded, was foaming white and high on the stone arches of the old bridge, and, far more seriously, had swept the pontoon bridge downstream. Company! The last syllable was drawn out, mingling with the shouts of other sergeants. Shut! Stand still! I front! A jingle of bridles and bits brought the battalion senior officers into the cleared space at the centre of the paraded companies. Two sides of the rectangle were each formed by three companies. Four companies were paraded on one long side and faced the solitary wooden triangle. Order! Bubs! Again and again. Hands slapped on wet wood, the brass hilt slopped into the muck, rain slanted on the ranks. Sergeants marched stiffly through the sludge, slammed into attention and saluted. Come here, Brazer! The mounted captains, miserable in their cloaks, acknowledged. Italian ready for management, Brazer! Very good, Major. At ease. Stand up! Collett's voice rode over wind and rain. Stand up! There was a convulsive shuffle in the mud. Sharp, his head fouled from the night's drinking, had paraded with a light company. Rhymer was embarrassed, but it was Sharp's place, and Hexwell's yellow face was expressionless. A pulse throbbed beneath the livid scar on the sergeant's neck. Daniel Hackman, the old rifleman, had come to Sharp before the parade and told him that the company was mutinous. It was doubtless an exaggeration, but Sharp could see the men were sullen, angry, and above all shocked. The only good news was that Wyndham had cut the punishment to sixty lashes. Major Hogan had paid the colonel a visit, and although the engineer had failed to persuade Wyndham of Harper's innocence, he had impressed himself by describing Harper's record. The battalion waited in the sweeping rain, full of cold misery. Dalyon! Shun! Another shuffle and Harper appeared between two guards. The Irishman was stripped to the waist, showing the massive muscles of his arms and chest. He walked easily, ignoring the rain and mud, and grinned towards the light company. He seemed the least concerned man on the parade. They lashed his wrists high on the triangle, spread his legs and tied them at the base, and then a sergeant pushed the folded leather between Harper's teeth so that he wouldn't bite his tongue off in the pain. The battalion's doctor, a sickly man with a streaming nose, gave Harper's back a cursory inspection. He was obviously healthy. 
A leather strip was tied round his kidneys. The doctor nodded miserably at Collett. The Major spoke to Wyndham, and the Colonel nodded. Carry on! The drumsticks came down on soggy skins. The sergeant nodded at the two lads. One! Sharp remembered it. His own flogging had been in a village square in India. He had been tied to an ox cart, not a triangle, but he remembered the first slashing cut with the leather thongs, the involuntary arching of the back, the teeth grinding into the leather, and the surprise that it was not as bad as he had expected. He had almost got used to the blows, was feeling confident, and resented it when the doctor stopped the lashes to check that he was still capable of receiving more punishment. Later, the pain had blurred. It had begun to hurt, really to hurt, as the lashes tore at the skin, and the alternate blows from two sides ripped and frayed till the watching battalion saw the glint of bone laid open as the blood dripped onto the village dust. God, it had hurt. The South Essex watched in silence. The drums, their skins stretched by the rain, could hardly be heard. They were like the muffled beats of a funeral. The lashes sounded soggy as they drew blood. The sergeant in charge of the flogging chanted the numbers, and in the background the French guns fired on. The drummer boys paused. The doctor stepped close to Harper's back, sneezed and nodded to the sergeant. Twenty-five! The rain diluted the blood. Twenty-six! Sharp looked at Hakeswell. Was there a glint of triumph in the face? It was impossible to tell. The face twitched in a spasm. Twenty-seven! Harper turned his head to face the light company. He wasn't moving at all as the blows hit him. He spat out the leather gag, grinned at them. Twenty-eight! Harder! A drummer boy used all his strength. Harper grinned even wider. Stop it! Collett stepped his horse forward. Put the gag in! They pushed the leather back in Harper's mouth, but he spat it out again and grinned through the punishment. There was an appreciative murmur from the like company, almost a laugh, and they saw that Harper was chatting to the drummer boys. The bastard had beaten the punishment. Sharp knew it was hurting him, but knew that Harper's pride would not let it show, would only let him pretend a total unconcern. The punishment finished, made almost farcical by Harper's unbelievable bravery. Cut him down! Sharp had seen men crumple to the ground after just two dozen strokes, but Harper stepped away from the cut thongs, still grinning, and did nothing more than massage his wrists. The doctor asked him a question, and the Irishman laughed, refused the offer of a blanket to be draped over his bleeding back, and turned to follow his escort off the parade. Drive it, Harper! Wyndham had spurred his horse forward. Sir? There was almost a contempt in Harper's voice. You're a brave man! Yeah. Wyndham tossed a gold coin towards the Ulsterman. For a brief fraction of a second, it seemed as if Harper might ignore the coin. Then a huge hand whipped up, snatched it from the air, and he gave the colonel his big infectious grin. Thank you, sir. The battalion gave a low collective sigh of relief. Wyndham must have realized, even as the punishment was happening, that he was flogging the most popular man in the battalion. There had been hostility in the parade, an unusual hostility. Soldiers didn't object to a flogging. Why should they? If a man deserved punishment, then a battalion would line up and watch punishment done. But soldiers also had a keen sense of injustice, and Sharp, watching Wyndham, knew that the colonel had sensed the battalion's outrage. A mistake had been made. It could not be admitted or reversed, not without proof. But the gold coin had been a clever touch. Wyndham, for all his pretense at being a simple country squire, was a clever man. And Hexwell, a cunning man. The sergeant kept his face expressionless as the parade was dismissed. Hegswell was triumphant. Harper had been defeated, demoted, and the company was at Hegswell's mercy. He now wanted one thing more, and would get it. Sharp's misery. And thanks to company rumour, the sergeant knew where that misery could be accomplished. At the house behind the cathedral with its two orange trees. Sharp found Harper in a shelter, two of the wives putting grease on his back, and bandaging the wounds. Well? Harper grinned. Hurt like hell, sir. I couldn't have taken much more. He held up the golden guinea. What'd I do with this? Spend it? No. The Irishman stared past Sharp into the sea of mud that was swept by great curtains of grey rain. I'll keep it, sir. Until I've killed the bastard. Or until I kill him. One of us, sir. But make it soon. 
before we leave this place. If ever they would leave Badajoz, Sharp thought. That afternoon he took a working party east, towards the Portuguese border. They found the precious pontoons aground in the flood and stripped naked to manhandle the great boats to where oxen could haul them back. The siege was bogged down in rain, mud, and misery. Barajoth was like a great castle in mid-ocean. The rain had flooded the fields to the south, the west, and the north, and still the wind shrieked at them, brought more water. And though it was a time for effort, the effort could not be made. The trenches were flooded, the sides collapsed, and when Gabians were used to shore the batteries, the water dissolved their earth, filling into liquid sludge that flowed out, leaving a hollow, useless wicker shell. Everything was fouled with mud. Carts, supplies, forage, food, uniforms, weapons, and men. The camp was foul, the only movement the slow flapping of wet canvas in the wind, and fever killed as many as the ceaseless French guns. The time that the French had hoped to gain by their attack on the parallel was given to them by the weather. Morale slumped. The first Monday of the siege was the worst. It had rained for a week, and it still rained, and darkness fell on an army that could scarce even light a fire any more. Nothing was dry. Nothing was warm. And a man from a Welsh regiment, a fusilier, went mad. There were shouts in the night, a terrifying scream as he carved his wife with a bayonet, and then hundreds of men were fumbling in the darkness, thinking it was a French attack, while the madman ran through the camp, slashing left and right with his weapon. He screamed that the resurrection of the dead was here and now, that he was the new messiah. And finally his sergeant cornered him, and, sensible that no one wanted a court-martial and execution, killed the man with one neat stab. Sharp met Hogan that Sunday night. The Major was busy. Colonel Fletcher's wound was keeping the chief engineer in his tent, and Hogan had taken much of his work. The Irishman was gloomy. We'll be defeated by the rain, Richard. Sharp said nothing. The spirit of the army was crushed by the water. They wanted to strike back, to hear their own guns firing at the French, but the guns, like the army, were bogged down. Hogan stared into the wet, pelting night. If only it would stop. And if it doesn't, then we give up. We've lost. Outside in the cold night, the rain smashed down, dripped heavily from the lip of Hogan's tent, and the slow drop seemed to Sharp to be the drumbeats of defeat. Unthinkable defeat. Chapter 17 On Tuesday afternoon, it stopped raining. There were suddenly scraps of blue sky between the tattered clouds, and, like some beast saved from imminent drowning, the army heaved itself out of the mud and attacked the trenches with renewed energy. They hauled the guns over the hill that night. The ground was still an almost impenetrable sludge, but they hauled on ropes, thrust wicker beneath reluctant wheels, and with an enthusiasm endowed by the break in the weather, the troops took the vast twenty-four pounders to the newly dug batteries. In the morning, in a miraculously clear dawn, there was a cheer from the British camp. The first shot had been fired, and they were hitting back. Twenty-eight siege guns were in place, protected by gabions, and the engineers directed the artillery officers so that the iron balls hammered at the base of the Trinidad Bastion. The French guns tried to destroy the siege guns, and the valley above the grey, placid floodwaters of the Ribillas was shrouded with smoke that swirled as the cannonballs pierced through the mist. At the end of the first day, when an evening breeze drifted the smoke southwards, a hole was visible in the masonry of the bastion. It wasn't much of a hole, more of a chipped dent, surrounded by smaller shot scars. Sharp stared at the damage through Major Forrest's telescope and gave a humorless laugh. Another three months, sir? They might notice us. Forrest said nothing. He was afraid of Sharp's mood, of the depression that had come with idleness. The rifleman had hardly any duties. Wyndham seemed to have abandoned the wives' parade. The mules were in pasture, and Sharp's time hung heavily. Forrest had spoken to Wyndham, but the colonel had shaken his head. And we're all bored, Forrest. The assault will cure all. Then the colonel had taken his foxhound south for a day's hunting, and with him half the battalion's officers. Forrest had tried unsuccessfully to cheer Sharp up. He looked now at Sharp's morose profile. How's Sergeant Harper? Private Harper's getting better, sir. Another three or four days and he'll be on duty. Forrest sighed. 
I can't get used to calling him private. It doesn't seem right. Then he blushed. Oh, dear. Uh, I, I suppose I've uh, put my foot in it. Sharp laughed. Well, no, sir, I'm getting used to being a lieutenant. It wasn't true, but Forrest needed reassurance. Are you comfortable, sir? Oh, very. It's a splendid view. They were watching the valley in the city, waiting for the attack that would be made just after dark. Half the army were on the hilltop, in the trench or the new half-finished batteries, and the French must have known that something was about to happen. It wasn't difficult to guess what was intended. The British guns were more than a half mile from the Trinidad Bastion, too far to be truly effective, and the engineers needed to cut that range in half. That meant building a second parallel, with new batteries right on the edge of the floodwaters, just where the French had built the Picarina fort. Tonight the fort would be attacked. Sharp had desperately hoped that the 4th Division, his own, would be chosen, but instead the 3rd and Light would go forward in the darkness, and Sharp was merely a spectator. Forrest looked down the slope. Well, it shouldn't be difficult. No, sir. Which was true, Sharp thought, but only half the battle. The Picarina fort was almost makeshift, a wedge-shaped obstacle facing the British tide and only intended to slow them down. It had a ditch that protected a low stone wall, and on the wall were palisades, split trunks loopholed for muskets, and the fort was far enough from the city so that the French guns could not douse the attack with grapeshot. The fort should fall, but that still left the lake formed by the damned Rebilias. The flood water blocked the direct approach to the city. Unless the lake could be drained, any attack would have to come from the south, squeezed between the water and the south wall, passing by the huge Pardaleris fort, and the attacking columns would be under fire from scores of French guns and shredded by grapeshot. Sharp borrowed Forrest's glass again and trained it on the dam. It was remarkably well built for a temporary structure, and Sharp could see a balustraded stone walkway along the dam top that led to the fort, much stronger than the Picarina that defended the dam. The fort and dam were hard by the city walls. A man with a musket on the San Pedro Bastion could easily fire down onto the stone walkway. Forrest saw where he was looking. What are you thinking, Sharp? I was thinking it wouldn't be easy to attack the dam, sir. You think anyone intends to attack the dam? Sharp knew an attack was intended. Hogan had told him so, but he shrugged his shoulders. No, I wouldn't know, sir. Forrest looked round conspiratorially. Don't tell anyone, Sharp, but we are going to. We, oui, sir? Sharp had a flicker of excitement in his voice. The battalion, sir? I'm speaking out of turn, Sharp, out of turn. Uh, Forrest was pleased at the quickening in Sharp's voice. The colonels offered our services. The general of division was talking to him. We may be the lucky ones. When, sir? I don't know, Sharp. Don't tell me these things. Look, but the curtain's going up. Forrest pointed to the huge number one battery. A gunner had snatched the last gabion from the embrasure, and one of the guns, silent for half an hour, bellowed flame and smoke down the hillside. The ball, under-aimed, struck the ground in front of the picarina, scarred the earth as it bounced, and then fell with a tall splash into the lake. The jeer of the French inside the small fort was audible four hundred yards away. The gunners raised the barrel half an inch by turning the huge screw beneath the breech. The barrel hissed as it was sponged out. The embrasure had been plugged again as defence against the inevitable fire from the city walls. The powder bags were thrust deep into the gun's throat, rammed home and the ball trundled into the muzzle. A sergeant leant over the touch hole, thrust down with the spike that punctured the powder bags, and then inserted the tube filled with fine powder that fired the charge. His hand went up, an officer shouted orders, and the gabions were pulled from the front of the battery. The men crouched with their hands over their ears as the sergeant touched the priming tube with a match burning at the end of a long pole, and the guns slammed back on the inclined wooden platform. The ball struck the timber palisade of the Picarina, splintering the tree trunks, driving the shards of unseasoned wood in vicious showers on the defenders, and it was the turn of the British to cheer. Forrest was looking at the fort through his telescope. He tut-tutted. Oh, lads, he turned to Sharp. It can't be very nice for them. Sharp wanted to laugh. No, sir. Oh, I know what you're thinking, Sharp, that I'm too charitable to the enemy. You're probably right, but, oh, I can't help imagining that my son is in there. I thought your son was an engraver, sir. Oh, yes, he is, Sharp, yes, he is, but 
If he was a French soldier, he might be in there, and, well, that would be most upsetting. Sharp gave up trying to follow Forrest's charitable imaginings and turned back to the Picarina. The other British guns had got the range, and the heavy balls were systematically destroying the flimsy defences. The French inside were trapped. They could not retreat, for the lake was to their rear, and they must have known that the cannonade would end in an infantry attack as soon as dusk gave way to night. Forrest frowned at the sight. Well, why don't they surrender? Will you, sir? Forrest was offended. Of course not, Sharp. I'm English. Well, they're French, sir. They don't like surrendering either. Well, I suppose you're right. Forrest did not really understand why the French, a nation he thought to be basically civilized, should fight so hard in such an evil cause. He could understand the Americans fighting for republicanism. A young nation could hardly be expected to have enough sense to recognize the dangers of such a foul political code, but the French... Forrest could not understand that. It was made worse that the French were the most powerful military nation on earth, and thus had harnessed their muskets and horsemen to the spreading republican evil, and it was Britain's obvious duty to contain the disease. Forrest saw the war as a moral crusade, a fight for decency and order, and victory to the British would mean that the Almighty, who could not possibly be suspected of republican sentiments, had blessed the British effort. He had explained his beliefs once to Major Hogan, and had been deeply shocked when the engineer had dismissed his ideas. My dear Forrest, you're fighting purely for trade. If Boney hadn't closed Portugal's harbours, you'd be snug in your Chelmsford bed. Forrest remembered the conversation and looked at Sharp. Sharp? Why are we fighting? Sir? For a moment, Sharp wondered if Forrest was proposing a surrender to the Picarina Fort. Why are we fighting? Why are we fighting? Yes, Sharp. Why do you fight? Are you against republicanism? Me, sir? <laughs> I couldn't even spell it. He grinned at Forrest, saw that the Major was serious. Oh, good Lord, sir, we always fight the French every twenty years or so. If we didn't, they'd invade us. Then we'd all be forced to eat snails and speak French. He laughed at Forrest. I don't know, sir. We fight them because they're meddles and bastards, and well, someone has to stamp all over them. Forrest sighed. He was saved trying to explain the political forces of the world to Sharp because Colonel Wyndham and a group of the battalion's officers spotted them and joined them at the parapet. Wyndham was in a good mood. He looked at the British shot flailing at the remains of the French parapet and slapped a palm with a clenched fist. Well done, lads! Give the bastards hell! He nodded civilly to Sharp and grinned at Forrest. Excellent day, Forrest, excellent! Two foxes! Hogan had once mentioned to Sharp that nothing cheered up a British officer as much as a dead fox. In addition to this double cause for satisfaction, Wyndham had more good news. He pulled a letter from his pocket and brandished it towards Forrest. Letter from Mrs. Wyndham, Forrest. Splendid news. Oh, good, sir. Forrest, like Sharp, was wondering whether the chinless Jessica had given birth to another young Wyndham, but it was not to be. The colonel opened the letter, hummed and hawed as he glanced down the first few lines, and Sharp could tell from the expressions of Leroy and the other newcomers that Wyndham had already been spreading whatever the good news turned out to be. Uh, here it is. Uh, we've had poacher trouble, Forrest. Damn bad trouble. Some rascal's been in among the pheasants. My good lady caught him. Splendid, sir. Forrest tried to sound enthusiastic. More than caught him. She bought a new kind of man-trap. Damn thing did so much damage that he died of the gangrene. Uh, here we are. Mrs. Wyndham writes, uh, It so inspired the rector that he incorporated Say into last Sunday's sermon to the undoubted edification of those in the parish unmindful of their station. Wyndham beamed at the assembled officers. Sharp doubted if anyone in the colonel's parish was unmindful of their station while Mrs. Wyndham was so mindful of her own, but he judged it not the right moment to say so. Wyndham looked again at the letter. Splendid man, our rector. Rise like a trooper. Know what his text was? Sharp waited for a gun to fire. Numbers, chapter 32, verse 23, sir? He spoke mildly. The colonel looked at him. Well, how the devil did you know? He seemed to suspect the rifleman might have been reading his post. Loire was grinning. Sharp decided not to say that he'd slept in a dormitory in a foundling home that had the text painted in letters three feet high down the wall. It seemed appropriate, sir. Quite right, Sharp. Damned appropriate. Be sure your sin will find you out.
It found him out, eh? <laughs> Died of the gangrene. Wyndham laughed and turned to greet Major Collett, who was bringing the colonel's servant laden with bottles of wine. The colonel smiled at his officers. Bob would celebrate. We'll drink to tonight's attack. The guns fired through dusk and on till in the darkness the bugles brought an overwhelming force of British infantry forward against the small redoubt. The gunners on the city wall, hearing the British cannonade stop, lowered their own muzzle and fired over the picarina at the hill slope. The round shot smashed into file after file of the attackers, but they closed up and walked on, and then there were deeper explosions from the city, and the watchers on the hill saw the dark red streaks of the shell fuses arc over the lake as the howitzers started firing. The shells exploded in scarlet blossoms. Riflemen of the 95th formed a skirmish line, curving round the fort, and Sharp could see the needle flames flickering round the line, seeking the loopholes. The French in the fort held their fire, hearing the commands in the darkness, listening to the rifle bullets overhead, waiting for the actual assault. On the hill the watching officers could see little except the flames of guns and explosions. Sharp was fascinated by the guns on the city's parapets. Each shot spewed flame, that for a few seconds was bright and stabbing as the shot sped away. But then for a brief moment the flame contracted into a strange writhing shape that existed independently of the cannon. A fading, twisting beauty, like a fire ghost, like intricate folds of flame-made drapery that swelled and disappeared. The sight had a mesmerizing beauty, nothing to do with war, and he stood and watched, drinking the colonel's wine, until a cheer from the dark field told him that the attacking battalions had lowered their bayonets for the charge. And stopped. Something had gone wrong. The cheer died, the ditch that ran clear around the small fort was deeper than anyone expected, and unseen from the low hilltop flooded with rainwater. The attackers had expected to jump into the ditch, and, using the short ladders they carried, climb easily onto the fort and carry their bayonets to an outnumbered enemy. Instead, they were checked. The French defenders crawled to their splintered ramparts and opened fire. Muskets crackled over the ditch. The British fire hammered uselessly at the fort's stonework and shattered palisades, while the French toppled men into the water or drove them back into the ranks behind. The French, sensing victory, rammed and fired, rammed and fired, and then, to light their helpless targets, lit the oil-soaked carcasses they had been keeping for the final assault and rolled the lights down the face of the fort. It was a fatal mistake. Sharp on the hilltop saw the attackers milling helplessly at the lip of the ditch. In the sudden flame light, the British were easy targets for the French gunners on the city walls, who fired at the sides of the fort, slicing whole ranks of men into eternity with single shots and forcing the attackers to the shelter of the fort's front edge. But the light also revealed a strange weakness in the fort. Sharp borrowed Forrest's glass, and through the dim lens could see that the defenders had driven wooden spikes into the face of the ditch to stop an attempt to climb its inner face. The spikes effectively reduced the width of the ditch to less than thirty feet, and as the glass was impatiently snatched from him by Major Collett, he saw the first ladders laid like a bridge onto the convenient spikes. It was the 88th, the same regiment that he had fought beside at Ciudad Rodrigo, the men from Connaught. Three ladders held, despite their green, wet, sagging timbers, and the Irishmen made their precarious crossing into the eye of a musket storm. And some dropped into the drowning ditch, but others scrambled across, and the dark uniforms lit by fire climbed the fort's escarpment as others crossed behind them. The lights of the carcasses died, the battlefield went dark, and only the sounds told the story of the fight to the hilltop. Screams came clearly, but few shots, which told those who understood that the bayonets were at work. Then there were cheers that spread back among the attackers, and Sharp knew that the British had won. The Connaught Rangers would be hunting the French survivors in the round-shot shattered fort, the long thin blades searching the broken timber, and he grinned in the night at the thought of a fight well fought. Patrick Harper would be jealous. The men from Connaught would have a few tales to tell, of how they'd walked the precarious bridge and won. Wyndham's voice disturbed his thoughts. That's it, gentlemen. Our turn next. There was a brief silence, then Leroy's voice. Our turn? We're going to blow up the dam. Wyndham's voice was full of enthusiasm. There were a dozen questions all asked at once, and Wyndham chose one to answer. When? I don't know when. Three days' time, probably. Uh, keep it to yourselves, gentlemen. I don't want every Tom, Dick, and Harry to know. There should be some surprise in our attack. Wyndham laughed, 
his good mood had lasted. Sir? Sharp's voice was low. Is Sharp at you? It was difficult to distinguish shapes in the darkness. Yes, sir. Permission to rejoin the company for the attack? You're a bloodthirsty bastard, Sharp. Wyndham's voice was cheerful. You ought to be my gamekeeper. I'll think about it. He moved off down the trench, leaving Sharp uncertain whether he was being considered as gamekeeper or soldier. There was a sudden glow in the trench beside him and the smell of pungent tobacco. Lechois's voice, deep and amused, came with the smoke. With any luck, Sharp, one of us will die. You'll get your captaincy back. But that occurred to me. The American laughed. <laughs> Do you think any of us think of anything else? You're a bloody ghost, Sharp. He put on a morbid tone. You remind us of our mortality. Which one of us will you replace? Any offers? Noir laughed. Not me, Mr. Sharp, not me. If you think I, I left Boston just so you could get my shoes, you're wrong. Well, why did you leave Boston? I'm an American with a French name from a royalist family fighting for the English. For a German king who's mad. There, <laughs> what does that tell you? Sharp shrugged in the darkness. He could think of nothing to say. I, I don't know. Nor do I, Sharp. Nor do I. The cigar glowed bright, then faded. Loire's voice was low and private. I sometimes wonder if I chose the wrong side. Did you? Loire was silent for a moment. Sharp could see his profile staring down at the dark city. I suppose so, Sharp. My father took an oath to defend the king's majesty, and I kind of inherited the burden. He laughed. Here I am, defending away. Sharp had rarely heard Loire talk so much. The American was a silent man who watched the world with ironic amusement. You know America is spoiling for war? Yeah, I heard. They want to invade Canada. Well, they probably will. I could be a general in that army, Sharp. I'd have streets named after me. Hell, even, even whole towns. He fell silent again, and Sharp knew that Loire was thinking about his probable fate. An unmarked Spanish grave. Sharp knew a score of men like Loire, men whose families had stayed loyal after the American Revolution, and who now fought as exiles for King George. Loire laughed again, a bitter laugh. I envy you, Sharp. Envy me? Why? Well, I'm just a, a drunk American with a French name fighting for a German lunatic, and I don't know why. You know where you're going. Do I? Yes, Mr. Sharp, you do, to the top, wherever that is. And that's why our happy band of captains are so frightened of you. Which one of us has to die for your next step? He paused to light another cigar from the butt of the first. I can tell you, Sharp, in my friendliest possible way that they'd much rather see you dead. Sharp stared at the dark profile. Is that a warning? Hell no. I'm just spreading a little gloom in the night. There was a trampling of feet in the trench, and the two officers had to squeeze into the side to let stretcher bearers pass, carrying the wounded from the picarina. The men moaned on the stretchers. One sobbed. Loire watched them pass and then clapped Sharp on the shoulder. Our turn next, Sharp. Our turn next. Chapter 18 What do you think? Hogan sounded worried. It's too complicated. Sharp shrugged. Fifty men could do it. You don't need a whole battalion. Hogan nodded. But whether the nod meant agreement was impossible to tell. He looked up at the thick clouds. At least the weather's on our side. If it doesn't rain, it won't rain. Hogan made the statement as if he controlled the weather. But it'll be dark. He looked over the parapet of the fort which protected the dam. Ah, you're right, it's too complicated. But the colonel insists. I wish you were going. So do I, but the colonel insists. Wyndham had refused Sharp's request. The rifleman was not to go with the light company. But instead he was to stay with Colonel Wyndham. Sharp grinned at Hogan. I'm his aide-de-camp. His aide-de-camp? Hogan laughed. I suppose that's a promotion of a sort. What are you supposed to do, run messages for him? Something like that. He didn't want me with a like company. He said my presence would embarrass Captain Rymer. Hogan shook his head. 
I just hope your Captain Rhyme is up to it. I really do. He looked at his watch, snapped the lid shut. Two hours to darkness. The plan sounded simple enough. One company, the Light Company, was to escort twenty sappers to the dam. The rest of the battalion was to create a diversion by making a false attack on the fort, and, under the cover of the noise, the sappers were to stack their twenty kegs of powder at the dam's base. It sounded simple, but Sharp did not trust it. Night attacks, as the army had discovered only four nights before, could lead to confusion, and the whole of Wyndham's plan depended on the light company reaching the foot of the dam by precisely eleven o'clock. If they were late, and the colonel would have no way of knowing their progress, the false attack would merely wake up the garrison and put sentries on the alert. Sharp had suggested to Wyndham that the false attack was unnecessary, that the light company should go alone, but the colonel had shaken his head. He wanted to lead the battalion into action, was looking forward to the night's events, and seemed unworried by Sharp's doubts. Of course they'll make it on time. There seemed little reason why not. The light company and their sappers did not have far to go. In the darkness they would leave the first parallel and head north for the river. Once on the bank of the Guadiana they would turn to their left and follow a path that led to the Rebilia stream below the castle walls. Their faces would be blackened, their equipment muffled, and they would move silently down into the ravine of the Rebilias and turn left. The most difficult moments would be the approach upstream towards the dam. It would be a journey of a hundred and fifty yards, within earshot of Barajodis' walls, till the men were between the San Pedro Bastion and the dam's fort. It was not a long journey. They had plenty of time to make it, but it would be slowed by the need for absolute silence. Hogan fidgeted with the lid of his watch. It was he who had convinced Wellington that the dam could be blown up, but his scheme was at the mercy of Wyndham's implementation. He exchanged his watch for his snuff-box and forced a smile on his face. At least everything else is going well. The second parallel was being dug. It was much closer to the walls of Barajoth, and from its cover new batteries were being made that would bring the siege guns within four hundred yards of the city's southeast corner, where on the Trinidad bastion the chip dent had become a hole exposing the rubble at the wall's core. The French were sending out work parties at night to repair the damage, while the British kept firing in the hope of killing the workmen. All day and all night the guns fired. At dusk, Sharp watched the light company move out. Harper was with them, in the ranks, insisting that his back was mended well enough. Hakeswell paraded them. He was making himself indispensable to Captain Rymer, anticipating his wishes, flattering him, taking the burden of discipline from his shoulders. It was a classic performance. The reliable sergeant, tireless and efficient, and it disguised Hakeswell's victory over the company. He had divided them, made them suspicious, and there was nothing Sharp could do. Colonel Wyndham inspected the company before they set off. He stopped in front of Harper and pointed to the massive seven-barrel gun slung on the Irishman's shoulder. What's that? Seven-barrel gun, sir. Is it regulation issue? No, sir. Then take it off. Hexwell stepped forward, his mouth twisted into a grin. Give it to me, Private. The gun had been a present from Sharp to Harper, but there was nothing Harper could do. He took the gun from his shoulder, slowly, and Hexwell snatched it from him. The sergeant put it on his own shoulder and looked at the colonel. Punishment, sir? Wyndham looked puzzled. Uh, punishment? For carrying a non-issue weapon, sir. Wyndham shook his head. He'd punished half already. No, sergeant, no. Very good, sir. Hexwell scratched at his scar and followed Wyndham and Rymer down the rank. After the inspection, when the colonel told the company to stand easy, Hexwell took off his shako and stared into its greasy interior. There was a curious smile on his face, and Sharp was puzzled. He found Lieutenant Price, pale beneath the burnt cork on his skin, and jerked his head towards the sergeant. What's he doing? God knows, sir. Price still thought of Sharp as a captain. He's always doing it now. Takes his hat off, stares inside, smiles, then puts it on again. He's mad, sir. He takes his hat off and stares into it. That's right, sir. He should be in bloody bedlam, sir, not here. Price grinned. Perhaps the army is a madhouse, sir. I don't know. Sharp was about to demand the seven-barrel gun from Hexwell when Wyndham, now mounted on his horse, called the light company to attention. Hexwell put his shako on, snapped his heels together, and stared at the colonel. Wyndham wished them luck, told them their job was to protect the sappers in case they were discovered, and if they were not detected, to do nothing. 
Off you go, and good hunting. The light company filed into the trench. Hexwell still carrying the seven-barrel gun, and Sharp wished he was going with them. He knew how dearly Hogan wanted the dam blown, how much easier the assault on the breach would be if the lake was gone, and it irked him to be absent from the attempt. Instead, as the cathedral clock sounded half-past ten, he was at Wyndham's side as the nine remaining companies of the battalion climbed out of the parallel onto the dark grass. Wyndham was nervous. They should be nearly there. Yes, sir. The colonel half drew his sword, thought better of it, and slid the blade back into the scabbard. He looked round for Collet. Jack? Sir? Ready? Yes, sir. Off you go. Wait for the clock. Collet walked forward into the darkness. He was taking four companies towards the city, towards the fort that protected the dam, and when the clock struck eleven, he was to open fire on the face of the fort to make the French believe that an attack was coming. The other companies under Wyndham were in reserve. The colonel, Sharp knew, was hoping that the false attack might reveal a weakness in the fort and turn itself into a real attack. He had hopes of leading the South Essex across the ditch, up the stone wall and into the defences. Sharp wondered how the light company were doing. At least there'd been no shots from the castle, no shouted challenge from the dam's fort, so presumably they were still undetected. The rifleman felt uneasy. If all went well, according to Wyndham's timetable, the dam should be blown a few minutes after eleven. But Sharp's instincts were gloomy. He thought of Teresa inside the city, of the child, and wondered whether the explosion, if it ever came, would wake up the baby, his baby. It still seemed miraculous that he had a child. Powder should be in place, Sharp. Y yes, sir. He only half heard the colonel's words, but he knew that Wyndham was merely talking to cover his nervousness. They had no way of knowing where the powder was. Sharp tried to imagine the sappers, laden down like south coast brandy smugglers, creeping up the ravine towards the dam, but Wyndham interrupted his thoughts. Count the musket flashes, Sharp. Yes, sir. He knew that the colonel was hoping that the fort, by some miracle, would be thinly defended, and that the South Essex could overwhelm it by sheer numbers. It was, Sharp knew, a vain hope. Off to their left, a half mile up the hill, the flames stabbed from the siege guns, and each flash lit the rolling smoke that filled the air over the floodwaters. The French guns replied, firing at the muzzle flashes, but the enemy fire had slackened in the last two days. They were hoarding their ammunition, saving it for the new batteries of the second parallel. Not long now, the colonel spoke to himself, then louder. Major Forrest? Sir? Forrest appeared from the darkness. All well, Forrest? Yes, sir. Forrest, like Sharp, had nothing to do. There was a sudden crackle of musketry muffled by distance from the north, and Wyndham spun round. Not us, I think. It was much too far away to be concerned with the light company's attack. Far off to the north, across the river, men of the 5th Division were keeping the French forts occupied. Wyndham relaxed. Must be soon, gentlemen. A shout came from the darkness in front. The three officers froze, listened, and it came again. Give it! A French sentry had challenged. Sharp heard Wyndham suck in breath. Give it! Louder. Gardez you! A musket stabbed from the fort towards the dark field. Damn! Wyndham spat the word out. Damn, damn, damn! There were more shouts from the fort, followed by a glow of light that grew, showed leaping flames, and a carcass was hurled into the darkness across the ditch, and Sharp could see Collett's company's outline by the fire. Tire! The shout carried easily. The loopholes of the small fort sprang musket fire, and the British companies replied. Damn! Wyndham shouted. We're early! Collett's companies were firing in platoon fire, the volleys rolling down the faces of the companies, the balls hammering audibly on the fort's stonework. The officers were shouting, trying to sound like a larger force, the muskets firing like clockwork. Sharp watched the defences. The French musket fire was constant, and he guessed that each man at a loophole or embrasure had at least two other men loading spare muskets. I don't think they're short of defenders, sir. Damn! Wyndham ignored Sharp. The cathedral clock sent its flat notes out to mingle with the sound of the firefight. More carcasses were lit in the fort, thrown out, and Sharp heard Collett ordering his men to go back into the darkness. Wyndham was pacing up and down, his frustration obvious. Where's the light company? Where's the light company? 
The gunners on the city wall heaved on the traces, turned their cannon and loaded with grape shot. They fired, the flames pointing down into the dark field, and Sharp heard the whistle of shot. Open order! Collard's voice carried back to Sharp. Open order! It was a sensible precaution against grape shot that would keep casualties low, but it wouldn't help to convince the French that a real attack was in progress. Wyndham drew his sword. Captain Leroy? Sir? The voice came from the darkness. Hold with your company. I made you call it right. Yes, sir. The grenadier company was ordered forward, adding to the confusion. Wyndham turned to Sharp. Time, Sharp? Sharp remembered hearing the cathedral bell. Uh, two minutes after eleven, sir. Where are they? Give them time, sir. Wyndham ignored him. He stared forward at the fort, at the burning carcasses that lit the whole ditch in the front of the field. Small groups of men were running forward, kneeling, firing, and sprinting back into the darkness, and Sharp saw one man fall in a shower of grape, his body motionless in the light of the flames. Two other men ran forward, grabbed his legs, and tugged the body back to their company. Aim! Present! Fire! The familiar orders rang round the field, the muskets fired towards the fort, and the deadly grape shot pattered down from the high walls. Captain Sterrett! Wyndham bellowed. Sir? Present yourself to Major College. Your company will reinforce him. Yes, sir. Another company went forward, and Sharp guiltily thought that another captain had been sent into the range of the grape shot. He wondered what had happened to Rymer. There was no firing from the rear of the fort, but no explosion either. He looked constantly, waiting for the eruption of flame and smoke, but there was only silence from the dam. Where are they? Wyndham pounded a fist against his thigh, cut at the air with his sword. Damn them, where are they? Men were stumbling back from the fight, wounded by the grape shot, and Collett was pulling the companies further back. There was no point, he reasoned, in losing men in an attack that was only a fake assault. The fire from the fort slackened. Still no explosion. Damn! We need to know what's happening. I'll go, sir. Sharp could see Wyndham's careful scheme collapsing. The French must know by now that the attack was not real, and it wouldn't take any great intelligence to reason that the dam was the real target. He tried to imagine the sappers again laden with their barrels. They could have been captured, sir. Maybe they've not even reached the dam. Wyndham hesitated, and as he paused, Major Collett shouted nearby. Colonel, sir! Jack, here! Collett came up, saluted. Can't go on much longer, sir. We're losing too much men to that damn grape shot. Wyndham turned back to Sharp. Well, how long will it take you to get there? Sharp thought fast. He didn't need to go softly or take the long way round. There was enough noise and chaos in the field to cover his movements, and he would go as close as he dared to the fort. Five minutes, sir? Then go. Listen. Wyndham checked Sharp's movement. I want a report, that's all you understand? See where they are. Have they been discovered? How long till they succeed? Understand? Yes, sir. I want you back here in uh, ten minutes. Ten minutes, Sharp. He turned to Major Collett. Can you give me ten minutes? Yes, sir. Good. Off you go, Sharp. Hurry! He began running, his dark uniform invisible against the night, towards the fort and the hidden dam. He went right, skirting the light of the carcasses, heading towards the ravine of the Rebelias downstream of the dam. He stumbled on tussocks, slipped on damp earth, but he was free, alone and free. Grape shot whistled overhead, far from the castle, but he was well beneath it, hidden in the darkness, and the stabbing musket flames from the fort were to his left. He slowed down, knowing that the stream could not be far, wary in case French patrols were lurking in the ravine. He unslung the rifle from his shoulder and pulled the flint back to full cock. The spring was heavy, satisfying, and he felt the sear fall into place. He was armed. What was it Hogan had said? Cap a pie, whatever that meant. But it felt good, and he grinned at the night as he went forward, slowly now, his eyes searching for the ravine's edge. He'd pulled his shako low over his eyes, so that the peak hid the white-scented cannon flames from his sight, preserving his night vision. And then he saw a streak of deeper shadow, fringed with bushes, and he knew he'd reached the stream bank. He lay flat, pulled himself forward, and peered over the edge. The ravine was deeper than he'd imagined. The bank fell steeply away from him down to a dull sheen of water some eighteen or twenty feet below. There was no sound from the ravine, except the stream's murmur, and no sign of the light company or sappers. He looked left. 
The dam was a black shape next to the fort, just forty yards from him, and it seemed empty, silent, holding back the huge weight of water. He slithered over the edge, still on his stomach, and let his weight slide him down between long-spined thorn bushes, the rifle held ahead of him. And suddenly there was a challenge. Who goes there? There was a hoarse, frightened whisper. Sharp! Who's that? Oh, Peter, sir. Thank God you're here. He saw the man's shape crouched beneath a bush beside the water. He went close. What's happening? I don't know, sir. Captain went forward, sir. Peters pointed towards the dam. Well, that was ten minutes ago, sir. Left me here. Do you think they've gone, sir? No. Stay here. He patted the man's shoulder. I'll come back this way. You'll be all right. Rhymer and the sappers could not be far away, being remarkably silent, and Sharp waded up the stream, the water up to his knees, and waited for a challenge. It came twenty yards from the dam, just beneath the fort, where small trees arched up over the Rebelias. Who goes there? Sharp, he whispered. Who's that? Thanks, Will. There was a hint of a chuckle. Come to help. Sharp ignored it. Where's Captain Rhymer? Here. Yeah. The voice came from beyond Hegswill, and Sharp pushed past the sergeant, smelling the man's breath, and saw a glint of gold from Rhymer's uniform. The colonel sent me. He's nervous. Well, so am I. Rhymer offered no further information. What's happening? The powder's late, and the sappers have gone back, and Fritch is up there. Well, he should be putting in the fuse. Rhymer sounded nervous, and Sharp could understand it. If the dam blew now by mistake, then the company would be caught by a wall of water. There were footsteps from the rampart of the fort, just thirty feet above them, and Sharp heard Rhymer draw in breath. The footsteps sounded casual. Rhymer began to breathe out. Oh, God, no! A flicker of flame the size of a candle that seemed to waver, go out, then spring up fierce and bright. In its light, Sharp could see two men, blue-uniformed, who held the carcass and then tossed it out over the ravine so that it fell, sparks flying up from it, down to the stream bed. Pieces of burning straw exploded from the carcass. It rolled on the ravine side, tumbling flame, and plunged into the stream. It hissed. The flames flickered, trying to hold the top edge, and then died. Rhymer's breath came out in a long, long sigh. Sharp put his mouth close to Rhymer's ear. Where are your men? Some here. Most have gone. The answer was not much help. Another flame appeared on the ramparts, grew like the first, and this time the French held it longer, so that the fire caught fiercely on the oil-soaked straw, so that it blazed like a signal beacon. They rolled it over the edge, it bounced once, spraying sparks, and then caught on the thorn bush. The thorns crackled and flared, and in the sudden light Sharp could see the engineer lieutenant, Fitchett, crouching motionless by a stack of barrels. The French must see him. But the French were not sure what they were looking for. Orders had come to look in the ravine, and so they peered over the edge and saw strange dark shadows, which was what a man expected to see at night, and they saw no movement, so they relaxed. Sharp could see the two men clearly. They seemed glad to be away from the front of the fort, were talking and laughing, and then they jerked upright, disappearing from sight, and there came the bark of an order, and he supposed an officer had come to the rampart. Fitchett moved. He began scrambling towards Rhymer and Sharp, trying to move silently, but he was panicked by the burning carcass, and he slipped, falling into the stream. A shout from the rampart, an officer's head leaning over the stone, and Fitchett had the sense to freeze, and Sharp saw the officer turn and shout a command. Flames came again on the rampart, a third carcass, and Sharp knew they would have to fight. Rhymer stared up at the fort, his mouth open. Sharp nudged him. Shoot the officer. What? Shoot the bastard! You've got riflemen, haven't you? Rhymer still didn't move, so Sharp took his own baker rifle, lifted the frizzen to check with the finger that the powder was still in the pan, and then aimed it up, through the stark thorn branches, towards the rampart. Rhymer seemed to wake up. Don't fire! The third carcass was hurled over the rampart, far across so that it bounced on the far side of the ravine and wedged itself on a rock. Fitchett saw it apparently falling towards him, and yelped and sprang towards the hidden company. The French officer shouted, Don't fire! Rhymer hit Sharp's shoulder, ruining his aim, so he kept his finger off the trigger. Fitchett fell into the thorn trees, rubbing his ribs where he'd fallen. He'd remembered the fuse and was trailing it, 
but Sharp wondered if any had fallen with the lieutenant into the water. Pitchett looked wildly around. For the lantern! There was a dark lantern hidden in the trees. Rhymer and Fitchett both started looking, bumping into each other, and the first French musket hammered from the ramparts, and the ball struck the trunk of one of the trees, and Fitchett swore again. Jesus, hurry! The French officer leant over the ravine, searching the shadows, and Sharp saw the shot, pulled the trigger, and the man went up and backwards, his face smashed red by the bullet, and Rhymer stared at Sharp. Why did you do that? Sharp didn't bother to answer. Fitchett had found the lantern, unclipped the door and a beam of light slanted in the thorns. Quick! Quick! Fitchett was talking to himself. He found the fuse, thrust the end into the flame, and waited till it was sputtering. Back! Back! Rhymer didn't wait to see the fuse burning. Back! He was shouting. Back! Sharp grabbed Fitchett. How long? Thirty seconds. Let's go! A second musket exploded on the ramparts, the ball thudding into the earth, and the group of men stampeded down the stream bed led by Rhymer, all imagining the sudden leap of powder flame, the shockwave, and the crashing, killing water. The French, suddenly bereft of their officer, shouted for help. They could see nothing in the light of the carcasses, hear nothing in the lingering echo of their musket shots. Sharp waited, watching the flickering light of the fuse, listening to the sudden rush of feet on the ramparts. The fuse was burning well, creeping towards the dam— and he turned and climbed the ravine wall, hard by the stonework of the fort, and a voice stopped him. That was a nice shot. Patrick? Hey. The Nonagall voice was very low. I thought I'd see if you needed any help. The huge hand clasped Sharp's wrist, and he was hauled unceremoniously to the brink of the ravine. That lot ran fast enough. He drowned otherwise. Sharp wedged himself against the base of a thorn bush. He tried to guess the number of seconds since Fitchett had lit the fuse. Twenty? Twenty-five? At least he and Harper should be safe. They were high on the bank, just across from the shallow ditch that left the ravine at a right angle to protect the small fort. The French were shouting excitedly. Sharp heard the rattle of ramrods in musket barrels, and then a crisp voice cutting through the chaos. He looked at Harper's vast bulk, crouched in deep shadow. How's your back? Bloody hurt, sir. Sharp waited for the explosion pushing himself down to the earth, imagining the kegs splintering and the wooden shards driven outwards. It must be soon. Perhaps Fitchett had used more fuse than he thought. The volley from the ramparts startled him. The French fired down the ravine, and Sharp heard the balls crash through the thorn spikes like the ripping of calico. A bird screeched indignantly, flapped up into the darkness, and he could hear the trampling of panicked feet downstream. Harper sneered. Like wet, bloody hands. What was it like? Any reluctance Harper had felt about criticizing Rhymer to Sharp had disappeared with the flogging. He spat down the ravine. Can't make his mind up, sir. It was one of the worst crimes in a soldier's book. Indecision kills. There was no explosion. Sharp knew that the fuse had been soaked or had broken, but whatever the cause, the powder was intact. A minute must have passed. Sharp heard a French officer shouting for silence. The man must be listening for noises downstream. But there was silence, and Sharp heard more orders given. Light flared on the rampart, and he knew more carcasses had been lit. He raised his head and saw three fiery bundles arc into the ravine, and he wondered if the carcasses might inadvertently light the fuse. But seconds passed, and there was no explosion. And then there were shouts from the fort. The powder had at last been seen. Sharp began sliding back down the slope. Come on! The French were shouting, making enough noise to cover their movements. There was little time. Sharp thought what he would do if he was the French officer, and imagined fetching water that could be thrown down onto the kegs and whatever fuse remained. He needed to see what was left. He slammed to a stop and looked upstream. The new carcasses brilliantly lit the foot of the dam. The kegs were clearly visible, and so was the fuse. One end had fallen from a bunghole in the lowest row of powder barrels. The other had dropped into the stream, which had extinguished the fire. Even without the water, the fuse would have been useless. Harper crouched beside him. What do we do? I need ten men. Leave it to me. What then? Sharp jerked his head towards the rampart. Six to take care of them, and three to push those carcasses into the water. And you? Leave me one carcass. He began to load the rifle, hurrying in the darkness, not bothering with the leather patch that surrounded the bullet, and gripped the seven grooves of the baker's barrel. He spat on the bullet and rammed it down. 
Are we ready? Yes, sir. Papa was grinning. I think this is a job for the rifles. Why not, Sergeant? Sharp grinned back. Damn Rhymer. Damn Hegswell, Wyndham, Collett, all the other new people who disturbed the battalion. Sharp and his riflemen had fought from the northern coast of Spain, down through Portugal, then out again to the Douro, to Talavera, to Almeida and Fuentes de Honoro. They understood each other, trusted each other, and Sharp nodded to Harper. The sergeant, as Sharp thought of him, cupped his hands. Rifles! To me, rifles! There were shouts from the ramparts, faces leant over. Sharp cupped his own hands. Company! Skirmish order! That should spread them out. But would they obey the old voices? Muskets fired from the fort, the bullets tearing the thorns, and Harper shouted again. Rifles! Feet trampled up the ravine. An officer shouted from the rampart, and Sharp heard the sound of steel ramrods in French barrels. They're coming, sir. Of course they were coming. They were his men. The first shapes came into sight, dark uniformed without the crossbelt of the red coats. Tell them what to do, Sergeant. He thrust his loaded rifle at Harper, grinned at him. It was like the old times, the good times. I'm going. He could trust Harper to do the rest. He broke from the cover of the trees and ran upstream into the light. The French saw him, and he heard the shouted orders. The ground was wet and slippery, dotted with smooth rocks. And once he skidded wildly, flailed his arms for balance, and sensed the musket balls banging down at him. It was a difficult shot for the French, almost straight downwards, and they were hurrying too much. He heard Harper behind him shouting the orders, and then the distinctive sound of Baker rifles. He followed the white fuse, and the great sloping earth dam was above him, holding the tons of water, and bullets flecked the slope as Sharp threw himself at the base of the barrels. The fuse had fallen free, and he pushed it into the bunghole, feeling the gritty resistance of the powder. The bung had gone. He looked round, trying not to hurry. The damn thing had disappeared. He tried to pull one loose from another keg, but it had been hammered tight. Then he thought of a stone, and scrabbling with his hand, found one and rammed it into the hole. A musket ball tore at his sleeve, burning the skin, but behind him the light was disappearing as his rifleman kicked carcasses into the water. They were still firing, and he was aware of voices shouting, and then he was finished, the fuse tight, and he backed away, pushing the white line up the bank away from the water. He needed fire. He turned and saw one carcass burning on the far bank. He leapt over to it, and the bullets hammered down from above, one hitting the carcass so that it seemed to jump like a live thing. His rifleman must be reloading. Get him fire! Harper's voice rang clear. There were redcoats in the ravine, running and kneeling, aiming upwards, and Sharp saw the new ensign dancing in excitement, his sword drawn. Then the muskets fired and the balls scarred the ramparts, and Sharp had a glimpse of his riflemen coming forward again, their guns reloaded. He would burn himself. There was no choice. The carcass flamed, and he bent down, picked it up by its base, feeling the heat. A rock thrown from the fort smashed into the straw, and it flared on his face, burning, burning, and he turned with it, scorched by the terrible heat. And in the corner of his eye as he turned, he saw a yellow flame, huge and foreshortened, stabbed from the ravine towards him. Bullets plucked at him, hit him, and he knew he'd been shot, but didn't believe it, and hurled the carcass at the white fuse. He tried to run, pain lanced his leg, his side, and he stumbled. He'd thrown the carcass too far. He was falling. He remembered the flaming mass landing too close to the powder, and he remembered the yellow flame that seemed to come from the ravine side. Nothing made sense, and then night turned to day. Flame and light, noise and heat. The deafening rolling blast thundered up and out, so that the men in the British trenches digging the new batteries saw the face of the San Pedro bastion lip with flame. The whole face of Barajot, from Castle to the Trinidad, was seared with the light, and the dam's fort was outlined black against the sheet of red that slammed up and belched smoke and fragments into the night. The blast was just a fragment of the explosion that had destroyed Almeida, but few men had seen that and lived, while this one was witnessed by thousands who watched the dark night split by fire and felt the hot wind buffet the sky. Sharp was thrown forward, snatched and hurled into the stream, bruised and deafened by the blast, blinded by the flame sheet. The stream saved his life, and he regretted it, knowing that in a second he would be crushed by the water, flattened by the falling tons of earth, rock, and lake. He hadn't meant to throw the carcass as far as he did, 
but he'd been scorched by flame, hit by bullets, and it hurt. It hurt. He wouldn't see his child. He thought death came slowly, and he tried to move as if he could outcrawl the weight of falling water. Heat slammed back and forth in the ravine, burning fragments hissed in the water. No muskets fired from the rampart. The blast had pushed the French away from the parapet, dazed by the noise it echoed off the vast city walls, thundered over the plain and died in the night. Harper pulled Sharp upright. Come on, sir. Sharp couldn't hear. What? He was dazed, senseless. Come on! Harper pulled him downstream, away from the fort, away from the dam that still stood. Are you hurt? Sharp moved automatically, stumbling on rocks, going away. He tried to turn to look at the dam. It's, it's still there. Yes, it held. Come on. Sharp shook himself free. It held. I know. Come on. The dam still stood. Burning fragments lit the huge wall, scorched and gouged by the explosion, but intact. It held. Harper pulled it sharp. Come on, for God's sake, move. A body was at Sharp's feet, and he looked down. A new ensign. What was his name? He couldn't remember. And the boy was dead. And for nothing. Harper pulled him downstream into the cover of the trees, dragging Matthew's body in his other hand. Sharp staggered, the pain shooting up his leg, and he felt tears in his eyes. It was failure. Miserable and complete. And the boy was dead who should not have died, and all because Sharp had tried to prove he was more than a messenger boy or baggage minder. Sharp felt as if there was some malevolent fate that had decided to destroy him, his pride, his life, all his hopes, and, in mockery, to make the failure more complete. The fates had shown him something worth living for. Teresa would have heard the explosion, would even now be rocking his child into a restless sleep. But Sharp, stumbling through the night, felt that he would never see the child. Never. Barachoth would kill him, as it had killed the boy, as it was killing all he had worked and fought for in nineteen years of soldiering. You stupid bastards! Hegswell appeared in the darkness, his voice like the croaking of the thousands of frogs that lived upstream. He sneered at them, punched at Harper. You pig-brained Irish bastard, move! He thrust at them with the squat barrels of the huge gun, and Harper, still helping Sharp, smelt the burnt powder from the seven barrels. The gun had been fired, and Harper had a vague memory, no more than an impression, of bullets coming from the ravine that had struck Sharp down. Harper turned to look for Hegswell, but the sergeant had gone into the night, and Sharp, his leg bleeding and hurt, slipped, and the Irishman had to hold him and pull him up the slope. His words were drawn by a sudden clamour of bells. Each bell in Barachot, from every church, hammered into the darkness, and for a second Harper thought they were celebrating the failure of the night's fight. Then he remembered. Midnight had turned, and now it was Sunday. Easter Sunday, and the bells rejoiced for the greatest of all miracles. Harper listened to the cacophony and promised himself a most unchristian promise. He would perform his own miracle. He would kill the man who had tried to kill Sharp. If it was the last thing he would do on this earth, he would kill the man who could not die. Dead. Chapter 19 Hold still, the doctor muttered, not so much to Sharp, who was rigid, but because he always said the words when operating. He twiddled the probe in his fingers, looking at it, then wiped it on his apron before pushing it delicately into the wound in Sharp's thigh. You've been wounded a fair bit, Mr. Sharp. Yes, sir. Sharp hissed the words. His leg felt as if a serpent with red-hot fangs was tearing at him. The doctor grunted, pushed down. Ah, splendid, splendid. Blood welled from the bullet wound. Ah, I have it, he pushed, feeling the bullet grate beneath the probe's tip. Jesus! Very present help in trouble, the doctor said the words automatically. He straightened up, leaving the probe in the wound. You're a lucky bad, Mr. Sharp. Lucky, sir? His leg was on fire, streaking pain from ankle to groin. Lucky. The doctor picked up a glass of claret that is orderly kept always full. He stared at the probe. To leave or not to leave, that's the question. He glanced at Sharp. You're a healthy bastard, yes? Yes, sir. It came out as a groan. The doctor sniffed. His cold hadn't improved since Harper's flogging. 
We could stay in there, Mr. Sharp, but I think not. You're lucky. It's not deep. The ball must have lost most of its force. He looked behind him and selected a long, thin pair of pincers. He inspected the ridged tips, spotted a piece of dirt, and spat on the instrument, wiping it dry on his sleeve. Right. Hold still. Think of Iglid. He pushed the forceps into the wound, following the track of the probe, and Sharp hissed imprecations at him, which the doctor ignored. He felt for the bullet, brought out the probe, pushed down again with the forceps, and then tightened his grip. Splendid. A moment more. He twisted. Sharp's leg exploded with agony, and the doctor pulled out the forceps and dropped them, the bullet in their jaws, on the table behind him. Splendid. Nelson should have known me. Right. Uh, tie him up, Harvey. Yes, sir. The orderly let go of Sharp's ankles and rooted around under the table, looking for a clean bandage. The doctor took the bullet, still in the forceps, and shook the blood from it in a pail of discoloured water. Ah! He held the bullet up. A pistol bullet. But I wonder it didn't penetrate. The range must have been too great. Do you want it? Sharp nodded and held out his hand. It was no musket bullet. The grey ball was just half an inch across, and Sharp remembered the foreshortened yellow flame. The seven-barreled gun used half-inch bullets. Doctor? Sharp? Uh, the other wound, is the bullet still in? No. The doctor was wiping his hands on his apron, already stiff with blood. It was the mark of seniority in his profession. Straight through, Sharp. All it did was break the skid. Here. He held out a tumbler of brandy. Sharp drank it and leant back on the table while the orderly washed and bandaged his leg. He felt no particular anger that Hexwell had tried to kill him, merely a curiosity and a thankfulness that he had survived. He was certainly not shocked. Had he been holding the volley gun, and had he seen Hexwell, he would have pulled the trigger and sent the sergeant spinning to the devil, and all without a second thought. He looked at the doctor. What's the time, sir? Uh, Dawn, sharp Dawn, an Easter dawn, and all men should rejoice. He sneezed violently. Uh, you should take things gently. Yes, sir. He swung his legs off the table and pulled on the cavalry overalls. There was a neat hole in the leather reinforcements of the right inner thigh where the bullet had entered. The doctor looked at the hole and laughed. Three inches higher and you'd have been the last of your iron. Yes, sir. Very droll. He tested his weight and found his leg could take it. Thank you, sir. All for nothing, Sharp. Except my small skill and humble duty. Half a bottle of rum and you'll be skipping like a lab. A credit to the medical board and the apothecary general, whose obedient servant I am. He pulled open the flap of his tent. Come and see me if you have any limb removed. I shall see no one else, sir. The troops had stood down from the morning alert, had piled arms, and were finishing meagre breakfasts. The guns were hard at work, firing now at the Santa Maria Bastion as well as the Trinidad, and Sharp imagined the smoke lying over the lake. Damn the powder! The amount of powder needed had been grossly underestimated. Otherwise, Sharp, Harper, and the riflemen would be heroes this morning. As it was, they were pariahs. Trouble was brewing. Sharp could smell it. The night's failure needed scapegoats. Bells clamoured from the city. Easter. Sharp limped towards his shelter, and to his right saw a group of Portuguese or Spanish women, followers of the army, picking small white flowers from a ditch bank. Spring was softening the landscape. Soon it would open the roads and the rivers to the French armies, and Sharp wondered if it was his imagination— or were the guns today firing at a faster tempo, pounding at a city that the British must take if they were to carry the war into the heart of Spain? The guns of Barajov could be heard by the troops far to the north, at Alcantara, and Caceres, and east at Merida, where British outposts stared down the empty roads waiting for a French relief army, and listened to the growl of the distant thunder. The guns. They dominated the Easter service, wrenching the thoughts of the people in the cathedral away from the celebrations. The high altar was resplendent in a white and gold facing, the virgin draped in gorgeous bejeweled robes, but the sound of the guns started dust from the high gold-painted cornice that circled the cathedral's interior, sifted it down past the stations of the cross, and the women prayed, told their beads, and the guns foretold a bloody assault. Barachov knew what was to come. The city had a long memory of other sieges, when Moors and Christians had taken turns to massacre the inhabitants. Be with us now, and in the hour of our need. Sharp! 
Major Collett tarred an irascible gesture from Wyndham's tent. Sir? How's the leg? The question was grudging. It hurts. Collett offered no sympathy. The colonel wants you. The light was yellowed inside the tent, the canvas giving Wyndham's face a tint of jaundice. He nodded at Sharp, not unfriendly, and gestured at a wooden crate. You'd better sit. Thank you, sir. The leg was shooting pain into his groin. He was hungry. Collett came in behind Sharp and pulled the flap shut. The Major was short enough to stand upright beneath the ridgepole. For a few seconds there was silence, and it struck Sharp suddenly that Wyndham was embarrassed. He felt a sympathy for the Colonel. It wasn't Wyndham's fault that Rymer had purchased the commission. It wasn't his choice to follow Lawford, and Wyndham, in the little Sharp knew of him, seemed a decent enough man. He looked up at the Colonel. Sir? The word broke the silence. Wyndham gestured irritably. Last night, Sharp. Pity. Yes, sir. Whatever the colonel meant by a pity, the dam not being broken, Matthew's death. General's disappointed. Not with us. We did our job. We got the powder to the dam. We blew it up. There wasn't enough dam powder. It's the engineers to blame, not us. Yes, sir. Sharp knew that Wyndham was beating round a very thorny bush. He had not brought Sharp into the tent to tell him this. Collett gave a pointed cough, and the colonel cleared his throat. It seems <clears throat> there was chaos at the dam, Sharp. Is that right? The word must have come from Captain Rymer, Sharp thought, so he shrugged. Night attacks are prone to confusion, sir. Well, I know that, Sharp. I know that. God damn it, man. I wasn't bleached yesterday. The rifleman made Wyndham nervous. The colonel remembered his first meeting back in Elvis, when he'd felt the same reluctance to ride straight at the fence. He glared at Sharp. I sent you to bring me back news, nothing else. Is that right? Yes, sir. Instead of which, you usurped Rymer's authority, organized an attack, stirred up the French, and had one of my officers killed. Sharp could sense his own anger flaring, and he fought it. He ignored the reference to Matthews. Stirred up the French, sir. Well, damn it, man, you fired at them. Captain Rymer told you that, sir. Ah, I'm not here to argue with you, did you or didn't you? I returned their fire, sir. Silence. Rymer had obviously told a different story. Wyndham glanced at Collett, who shrugged. Both men believed Sharp, but Rymer's authority had to be backed up. Wyndham changed tack. Nevertheless, you disobeyed my orders. Yes, sir. Silence again. Wyndham hadn't expected the answer, or perhaps he'd expected excuses, and Sharp had made a simple admission of disobedience. But to ask the reason why was to invite a criticism of Rymer that the colonel didn't want to hear. He looked at Sharp. The rifleman seemed so damned confident. He sat there, seemingly unworried. The strong, scarred face spoke of a competence and trustworthiness that disarmed the colonel. Wyndham shook his head. Oh, damn it, Sharp. Rymer's in an impossible position. He's trying to establish his authority over a company, and he's finding it difficult while you're on his heels. Collett stirred, perhaps disapprovingly, but Sharp nodded slowly. Yes, sir. Well, the rifles, for instance. Sharp felt a flicker of alarm. Well, the rifles, sir. Collett broke in, his voice harsh. Rhymer's opinion is that they led to our casualties last night. They're too slow to load, and last night they let us down. Muskets would have been faster, more effective. Sharp nodded. True, but that was only last night. And that's only your opinion. Rhymer disagrees. Collett paused. And Rymer has the company. Which he must run as he sees fit. Wyndham took up from Collett. Which means the rifles must go. Sharp's voice for the first time rose. We need more rifles, sir, not less. Which is what I'm talking about. Wyndham's voice rose as well. You cannot run the light company. One man must do it. Which was Rymer. Sharp's anger subsided. He was being punished, not for his own failure, but for Rymer's, and all three men knew it. He forced a rueful smile. Yes, sir. Silence again. Sharp could feel that there was one more thing to be said, one thing the colonel was shying from, and he had had enough. He'd make it easy, get the damned interview over. So, what happens now, sir? Happens? Oh, we go on, Sharp, we go on. Wyndham was avoiding the answer, but then he plunged in. Major Hogan talked to us, and he was upset. 
The colonel paused. He'd plunged in at the wrong place, but Sharp could guess at what had happened. Wyndham wanted rid of Sharp, at least for the moment, and Hogan had engineered an answer that Wyndham was hesitant about mentioning. Yes, sir. You'd like your assistant, Sharp, for a few days, anyway. The engineers are short-handed, always are, damn them. And he asked for your help. I said yes. So I'm to leave the battalion, sir? For a few days, Sharp, for a few days. Collett stirred by the tent pole. Damn it, Sharp, they'll be handing out captaincies like pound notes on election day soon. Sharp nodded. Yes, sir. Collett had made the point. Sharp was an embarrassment, not just to Rymer, but to all the captains who saw him sniffing at their heels. If he could leave the battalion now, go to Hogan, then there'd be no difficulty in bringing him back after the assault into a captaincy. And the assault would be soon. Wellington was not patient in a siege. The fine weather was bringing the possibility of a French countermove, and Sharp sensed that the infantry would be hurled against the city very soon. Too soon, probably. Collett was right. There'd be vacancies. Too many vacancies, made by the French guns in Barachov. Wyndham seemed relieved by Sharp's evident acceptance. Oh, that's it then, Sharp. Good luck. Good hunting. He barked an embarrassed laugh. We'll see you back. Yes, sir. But not, Sharp thought, in the way Wyndham planned. The rifleman, as he limped from the tent, didn't object to the colonel's solution, or rather Hogan's solution, but he was damned if he'd be nothing more than a pawn to be pushed around a board and sacrificed. He had lost his company, and now he was pushed out of the battalion, and he felt an anger inside him. He was superfluous. That damn them all, he would make the forlorn hope. He would live, and they would take him back, not as a convenient replacement for a dead captain, but as a soldier they could not ignore. He would fight back. God damn them, he would fight back, and he knew where he was going to start. He heard a cackle coming from the battalion's supply dump. Hakeswill. Bloody Hakeswill, who'd emptied the seven-barrel gun at him in the darkness. Sharp turned towards the sound, winced as the pain seared his leg, and marched towards the enemy. Chapter 20 Hexwell cackled. You bloody fairies! You're not bloody soldiers! Stand still! The twelve riflemen stood still. Each would have gladly killed a sergeant, but not here. Not in the supply dump that was open to the gaze of a whole camp. The murder would have to be done at night, in secret, but somehow Hexfield seemed always to be awake, or alert to the smallest sound. Perhaps he was right. He could not be killed. Hexfield walked slowly down the rank. Each man was stripped to his shirt, the green jackets lying on the ground in front of them. He stopped by Hagman, the old poacher, and pushed at the jacket with his foot. What's this, then? His toe was pointing at the black stripe sewn on the sleeve. Sing your rifleman's badge, Sergeant. Senior Rifleman's badge, Sergeant. Hakeswell imitated Hagman. The yellow face twitched. Bloody decrepit you are. He pushed the sleeve into the mud. Senior Bloody Rifleman. Oh, from now on you're a bloody soldier. He cackled, letting his fetid breath wash over Hagman's face. The Rifleman did not move or react. To do so was to invite punishment. Hakeswell twitched and moved on. He was feeling pleased with himself. The riflemen had annoyed him, because they seemed to him to form an elite group, a close-knit group, and he had wanted to smash them. He'd suggested to Rymer, as they straggled back from the dam, that the rifles were a hindrance. He'd hinted that Rymer could begin to establish his ascendancy over Sharp's old company by disbanding the riflemen, and it had worked. You! About turn, you poxed Irish pig! Turn! His spittle sprayed Harper. Harper paused for a fraction of a second, and saw an officer watching. He had no wish to end his days in front of a firing squad. He turned round. Hexwell drew his bayonet. How's your back, Private? Fine, Sergeant. Fine, fine. Hexwell mimicked the Donegal accent. That's good, Private. He put the flat of the bayonet high on Harper's back and drew the blade upwards, over the unhealed cuts, over the scabs, and the blood welled out to stain the shirt. You've got a dirty shirt, Private. A dirty Irish shirt. Yes, Sergeant. Harper kept the pain out of his voice. He promised he'd kill this man, and he would. Wash it. Hexful sheathed his bayonet. Well done. The twelve riflemen watched the sergeant. He was mad, there was no doubt about that. 
In the past few days he'd taken to a new habit, of sitting by himself, taking off his hat, and talking into it. He talked to his shaker as if it was a friend. He told it his plans and his hopes, how he'd find Teresa, and his eyes would flick up to the company to catch them looking at him as they listened, and then he would cackle. I'm gonna have her. His eyes would go back to the Shaco's greasy interior. I'm gonna have the pretty lady, oh yes. Obadiah's gonna have her. Eggswill stalked in front of the Twelve. You're gonna wear red coats now, not bloody green. You're gonna carry muskets, not those toys. He gestured at the Twelve rifles that were stacked by the unlocked arms chest. He laughed. You're gonna be real soldiers, like Sergeant Eggswill, your friend. Me. <laughs> He cackled. You hate me, don't you? The face twitched involuntarily. I like that, because I, I hate you. He took his hat off, looked inside, and his voice became whining, obsequious. I hate them, I really do. He looked up, his voice going back to normal. Well, you think I'm mad? He laughed. Not so I don't know. He saw their eyes flicker to the left and turned. The bastard Sharp was approaching, limping. Hexwell put his hat on and saluted. Lieutenant, sir. Sharp returned the salute. Sergeant. His voice was civil. Stand the men at ease. But, sir, Lieutenant's at ease, Sergeant. Hexwell twitched. He couldn't fight Sharp through the formal hierarchy, only in the dark lanes of his hatred. Sir. He turned to the rifleman. Detail? Stand at ease. Sharp looked at the riflemen, his riflemen, the men he had led from Karuna, and saw the misery in their faces. They were being stripped of their pride along with their green jackets. Now they must take one more shock. He hated making speeches. He felt tongue-tied and adequate. I've just come from the colonel's tent, and, well, I shall be leaving the battalion today. He saw the expressions change into something approaching despair. I wanted to be the one to tell you, Sergeant. Hexwell, elated at the news, stepped forward, but saw that Sharp was talking to Harper. Hexwell stopped. He could sense a danger in the air, but he could not pin it down. Sir? Harper's voice was tense. Pick up the green jackets. Bring them here. Sharp was talking calmly, almost casually, the only man who seemed unaware of the tension. Lieutenant, sir. Sharp turned. Sergeant Hexwell? My orders are to take the jacket, sir. Where, Sergeant? Hexwell cackled. Well, to the gunners, Lieutenant, sir, to be used as, as swabs. Or I'll save you the trouble, Sergeant. Sharp's voice was almost friendly. He turned away and waited till Harper brought the jackets. Put them there. He pointed at the ground next to him. Harper bent down. He remembered Hexwell's crazy words spoken into his shako, and Harper was sure what they meant, and now he tried to warn Sharp. He's after Teresa, sir. He knows where she is. He muttered it, sure that Sharp had heard the news, but the officer's face stayed calm and relaxed. Harper wondered if he'd spoken too softly. Sir? I heard you, Sergeant, and thank you. Rejoin the rank. Sharp still did not react. Instead, he smiled at the twelve men. We've been together for seven years, some of us, and I don't think this'll be the finish of that. Hope flickered into their faces. But if it is, then I want to thank you. You're good soldiers, good riflemen. The best. Now their faces showed some pleasure, but he did not look at them, nor at Hegswill, but crossed to the arms chest and picked a rifle at random. He held it up. I'm sorry you're losing these. I'll make you one promise. You'll get them back. As you'll get back your jackets. They smiled openly. Hexwell cackled and then saw Sharp's face. Sharp was staring in horror at the lock of the rifle. He looked up at Hexwell. Sergeant? Lieutenant, sir. Whose rifle is this? Rifle, sir. Uh, uh, Dunno, sir. He twitched. He could feel a threat somewhere. Well, it's loaded, Sergeant. <laughs> loaded, sir? Well, it can't be, sir. You checked? Hexwell hesitated. His power was preserved through meticulous attention to military detail, but in his eagerness to strip off the green jackets, he had not inspected the rifles. His mind sorted through the problem and he smiled. 
Not yet, Lieutenant, sir. Uh, but they're not in the chest yet, sir. Lieutenant, are they? I'll uh, inspect them in a minute. He twitched furiously, the blue eyes blinking as he tried vainly to control his face. Sharp smiled, still courteous. I'll save you the trouble, Sergeant. He laid the first rifle down carefully, and then picked up the others one by one and pointed each at Hakeswill's vast belly. He cocked each flint, pulled each trigger, and Hakeswill's face twitched each time. Sharp's eyes did not leave the sergeant's face, not even when he stooped to pick up another rifle, and he watched the spasm and saw the relief each time as the spark died in an empty pan. The riflemen, humiliated by the sergeant, grinned at the fear they saw in Hakeswill. They were still nervous of him. He was the man who could not be killed, and Sharp knew that their nervousness had to be dispelled. He put the last rifle in the chest, and as carefully as he'd put it down, picked up the first. Hexville stared as Sharp pulled back the flint, past the half-cock, back till the sear clicked into place. The sergeant licked his lips, twitched, and flicked his eyes up to Sharp's face, then back to the muzzle that was pointing at his belly. Sharp walked slowly towards Hexville. You can't be killed, is that right? Hexwell nodded, tried to smile, but the huge muzzle was coming towards him. Sharp walked slowly. They tried to hang you, and you lived, is that right? Hexwell nodded again, his mouth a rictus. Sharp was limping from the bullet wound in his thigh. Are you going to live forever, Sergeant? One of the riflemen sniggered, and Hexwell darted a look to see which one, but Sharp jerked the barrel up and the movement brought the eyes back. Are you going to live forever? I don't know, sir. Not lieutenant, sir. Lost your tongue, Hexwell? No, sir. Sharp smiled. He was very close to the sergeant, and the rifle was pointed up beneath Hexwell's chin. I think you're going to die, sergeant. Shall I tell you why? The blue, childlike eyes flicked left and right, as if searching for help. Hexwell expected to be attacked by night in the shadows, but never in bright daylight among hundreds of potential witnesses. Yet no one was taking any notice. The rifle jerked, touching his sweated skin. Sir. Look at me, Sergeant, I'm telling you a secret. Hexwell looked at Sharp, their eyes level. Sir? The riflemen watched, and Sharp spoke clearly for them. I think, Sergeant, that no one can kill you except... He spoke slowly, as if to a child. Except, Sergeant, someone whom you had tried to kill, and whom you failed to kill. The fear was obvious on the sweating face, the yellow paling. Can you think of anyone like that, Sergeant? The face twitched, shook, and the rifle jugged up again into the chin. No, sir. Good. The stubby foresight of the baker was cold on Hegswill's skin. Sharp dropped his voice so that only the sergeant could hear him. You're a dead man, Obadiah. The magic has gone. He suddenly shouted. Bang! Hegswill leapt back, startled, let out a pathetic yelp like a whipped child, and stumbled onto the grass. Sharp laughed at him, pointed the gun and pulled the trigger onto an empty, unloaded pan. Hexwell sprawled on the grass, his face murderous, but Sharp turned away from him to his grinning rifleman. Shut! They snapped to attention. Sharp spoke to them again, but this time his voice was crisp. Remember, I made you a promise. You'll get your rifles back, your jackets back, and you'll get me back. He didn't know how he could do it, but he would. He turned back to the sergeant and pointed at the seven-barrel gun on Hexwell's shoulder. Give me that. Hexwell handed it over meekly with its ammunition pouch, and Sharp slung the gun on his own shoulder next to his rifle. He looked down at the sergeant. I'm coming back, sergeant. Remember that. He scooped the jackets into an awkward bundle, put them under his arm and limped away. He knew that Hexwell would exact a revenge on the rifleman, but he knew too that the sergeant had been humiliated shown to be vulnerable, and the company, Sharp's company, needed to know that much. It was a small victory, a petty victory even, but it was a start on the long fight back, a fight that he knew must end in the breach of Barachov. Part 4 Saturday, April the 4th to Monday, April the 6th, 1812 Chapter 21 News came that the French, at last, were moving, not against Wellington at Badajoz, but towards the new Spanish garrison in Ciudad Rodrigo. The reports came from the partisans, and from the dispatches they'd captured, some still stained with the blood of enemy messengers, and told of disagreements among the French generals, 
of delays in gathering their troops, and their difficulties in replacing the French siege artillery, all of which had been captured inside the northern fortress. The news spurred Wellington into greater speed. He wanted the siege of Barajoth done, and he could not be persuaded that the French chances of retaking Ciudad Rodrigo were remote. He didn't trust the Spaniards in the town, and wanted to march the army north to bolster his allies' resolve. Speed, speed, speed. For the six days after Easter, he pounded the message at his generals and staff officers. Give me Barajov! For the six days, the new batteries built in the ruins of the Picurina fort had fired incessantly at the breaches, at first with small effect, until, almost unexpectedly, the loosened stone had cascaded into the ditch and was followed by a dust-spewing avalanche of rubble from the wall's core. The sweating, powder-stained gun crews had cheered, while the infantry, guarding the batteries against another French sortie, stared at the incipient breaches and wondered what welcome the French were preparing for the assault. By night the French tried to repair the damage. The Picarina guns sprayed the two breaches with grapeshot, but still each morning the broken edges of the stonework had been padded with thick bales of wool, and so, each dawn, the gunners fired at the mattresses, until, in an explosion of greasy fleeces, the padding fell away and the iron balls could start again on the wall proper, gouging at it, crumbling it, carving the double path into the city. The dam still stood, and the floodwaters still stretched south of the city, forcing any assault on the bastions to march obliquely against the walls instead of straight on. The northern batteries pounded at the dam's fort, while the infantry dug their trenches forward, trying to take their spades and muskets to the very edge of the small fort but the trenching was thrown back. Every gun on Barajoth's east wall, from the high kestrel-ridden castle to the Trinidad bastion, opened up on the creeping trench, till the workers were smashed and no one could live in the iron hell, and so the attempt was given up. The dam would stay, the approach would be oblique, and the engineers did not like it. Time! I want time! Colonel Fletcher, wounded in the French foray, was out of bed. He pounded the map in front of him. He wants a bloody miracle. I do. The general had entered the room unheard, and Fletcher twisted round, grimacing because the wound still hurt. My lord, uh, my apologies. The Scottish growl sounded far from apologetic. Wellington gestured the apology away, nodded at the men waiting for him, and sat down. Major Hogan knew the general was just forty-three, yet he looked older. Perhaps they all looked older. The siege was wearing them down as it was wearing away the two bastions, and Hogan sighed because he knew that this meeting, on Saturday the 4th of April, as he carefully noted at the top of his notebook page, would once more be a wrangle between the general and the engineers. Wellington took out his own map, unrolled it, and weighted the corners with ink bottles. Good morning, gentlemen. Expenditure? The gunner colonel pulled paper towards him. Uh... Yesterday, my lord, one thousand one hundred and fourteen twenty-four pounders, six hundred and three eighteen pounders. He gave the figures in a flat monotone. One gun burst, sir. Burst? The colonel turned the paper over. Uh, twenty-four pounder in number three, my lord. I shot halfway down the ball. We lost three men, six wounded. Wellington grunted. It was astonishing, Hogan always thought, how the general dominated a room by his presence. Perhaps it was the blue eyes that seemed so knowing or the stillness of the face round the strong, hooked nose. Most of the officers in this room were older than the Viscount Wellington, yet all of them, with the possible exception of Fletcher, seemed in awe of him. The general wrote the figures on his small piece of paper, the pencil squeaking. He looked back to the gunner. Powder? Uh, plenty, sir. Eighty barrels arrived yesterday. We can keep firing for another month. Well, bloody need to. Uh, sorry, my lord. Fletcher was hatching marks on his map. A trace of a smile flicked the corners of Wellington's mouth. Colonel? My lord? Fletcher affected surprise. He looked up from the map, but kept his pen poised as though he was being interrupted. I can see you're not prepared for the meeting. Wellington gave a small nod to the Scotsman and turned to Hogan. Major, any reports? Hogan turned his notebook back two pages. Uh, two deserters, my lord, both Germans, both from the... Yes, sir, Darmstadt Regiment. They confirm that the Germans are garrisoning the castle. Hogan raised his eyebrows. They say morale is high, my lord. Then why desert? A uh, brother of one, my lord, is with the KGL. Aha. You're sending them there? Yes, sir. 
The King's German Legion would welcome the recruits. Anything else? Wellington liked to keep the morning conferences brisk. Hogan nodded. They confirm, sir, that the French are devoid of round shot, but claim plenty of canister and grape. We already know that. He hurried on, forestalling a complaint of repetition from the general. They also say the city is terrified of our massacre. Then they should plead for a surrender. The city, my lord, is partly pro-French. It was true. Spanish civilians had been seen on the walls firing muskets at the trenches, sapping forward towards the fort at the dam. They are hoping for our defeat. But, Wellington's voice was scornful, they hope to avoid reprisals if we win. Is that right? Hogan shrugged. Yes, sir. It was the Irishman thought of vain hope. If Wellington had his way, and he would, the assault would be soon, and the way into the city hard. If they did win through the breach, and Hogan acknowledged the possibility that they might not, then the troops would lose all vestiges of discipline. It had always been so. Soldiers who were forced to fight through the terror of a narrow breach claimed the right to possess the fortress and all within it. The Irish remembered Drogheda and Wexford, the town sacked by Cromwell and his English troops, and the stories were still told of the victors' atrocities. Stories of women and children herded into a church that was fired, the English celebrating while the Irish burned, and Hogan thought of Theresa and her child, Sharp's child. His thoughts snapped back to the meeting, as Wellington dictated a fast order to an aide-de-camp. The order forbade any looting inside the city, but it was given, Hogan thought, without much conviction. Fletcher listened to the order, and then once again pounded the map with his fist. Bomb them! Ah, Colonel Fletcher is with us. Wellington turned to him. Fletcher smiled. I say bomb them, my lord. Smoke them out. I'll give up. And how long, pray, before they give up? Fletcher shrugged. He knew it would take weeks for the squat howitzers to reduce enough of Barachov to smoking rubble, to burn the food supplies and thus force a surrender. A month, my lord? Two, more like, perhaps three. And let me advert you, Colonel, to the notion imperfectly understood, though it may be within the walls, that the Spanish are our allies. If we indiscriminately bomb them with shells, it is possible you will grant me that our allies will be displeased. Fletcher nodded. I'll not be too happy, my lord, if your men rape everything that moves and steal everything that doesn't. We will trust to our soldiers' good sense. The words were cynically said. And now, Colonel, perhaps you can tell us about the breaches. Are they practical? No, sir, they are not. Fletcher's Scottish accent was stronger again. I can tell you a good deal, sir, most of it new. He turned the map round so that the general was looking at the two bastions from the point of view of an attacker. The Santa Maria was to the left, Trinidad to the right. Fletcher had marked the breaches. The Trinidad had lost half of its face, a gap nearly a hundred feet wide, and the engineer had penciled in his estimate of the height reduction. Twenty-five feet. The flank of the Santa Maria facing the Trinidad was equally badly hit. The breaches, as you can see, my lord, are now about twenty-five feet high. That's a hell of a climb. That's higher, if you'll forgive me for pointing it out, than the unbreached wall at Ciudad Rodrigo. He leant back as if he had made a scoring hit. Wellington nodded. Well, we are all aware, Colonel, that Badajov is appreciably bigger than Ciudad Rodrigo. Pray, continue. My lord, Fletcher leant forward again. Let me advert you to this. He grinned as he used one of Wellington's favourite expressions. His broad finger settled on the ditch to the front of the Santa Maria. They've blocked the ditch here and here. The finger moved to the right of the Trinidad breach. They're boxing us in. His voice was serious now. He could twist the general's tail from time to time, but only dared do it because he was a good engineer, trusted by Wellington, and he saw it as his job to give his true point of view and not be a lickspittle. The finger tapped the ditch. It seems they put carts in the ditch, upturned carts, and lengths of timber. You don't have to be a genius to work out. They plan to fire those obstacles. You can see what will happen, gentlemen. Our troops will be on the ditch, trying to climb a bloody great ramp, and there'll be no escape from the grave shot. They can't go left and right into the darkness to regroup. They'll be trapped, lit up like rats in a bloody barrel. Wellington listened to the impassioned outburst. You sure? Hey, my lord, and there's more. Go on. The finger stayed to the right of the Trinidad breach. The French have dug another ditch here, in the bottom of the ditch, and flooded it, 
We'll be jumping into water, deep water, and it looks as if they're extending it around here. The finger traced a line back in front of both breaches. Wellington's eyes were on the map. So, the longer we wait, the more difficult it becomes. Fletcher sighed but conceded the point. Eh, there's that. Wellington raised his eyes to the engineer. What do we gain by time? I can lower the breaches. By how much? Ten feet? How long? A week? Wellington paused, then... You mean two weeks? Eh, my lord. Perhaps. We don't have two weeks. We don't have one week. We must take the city, and it must be soon. There was silence in the room. Outside the windows, the guns hammered over the floodwaters. Wellington looked back to the map, reached over the table, and put a long finger on the huge space between the bastions. There's a ravel in there. Eh, uh, hey, my lord, aren't still being built. The ravelin was sketched on the map. A masonry wedge, diamond-shaped, that would break up an attack. If the French had been given time to finish it, before the siege guns had started firing, it would have been like a new bastion, built in the ditch, outflanking all attacks. As it was, it formed a vast, flat-topped obstacle, surrounded by the ditch, smack between the two breaches. Wellington looked up to Fletcher. You seem very sure of this new information? Damn, a lot I am. We had a, a laddie on the glasses last night. Did a good job. The praise was grudging. Who? Fletcher jerked his head towards Hogan. One of uh, Major Hogan's lads said. Who, Major? Hogan stopped fidgeting with his snuff box. Richard Sharp, sir, you remember him. Wellington leaned back in his chair. Good Lord. Sharp. He smiled. What's he doing with you? I thought he had a company. He did, my lord. His gazette was refused. Wellington's face scowled. By God, they don't let me make a man corporal in this damned army. So, Sharp was on the glasses last night. Hogan nodded. Yes, sir. Where is he now? Outside, sir. I thought you might want to speak to him. Good lord, yes. Wellington's tone was dry. The only man in the army who's been to the top of the glasses. Fetch him in. There were generals of division, of brigade, gunners, engineers and staff officers, and they all turned to stare at the tall, green-jacketed man. They'd all heard of him, even the generals newly arrived from England, because this was the man who'd captured a French eagle, and who looked as if he could do it again. He looked battered and hard, like the weapons had festooned him, and his limp and scars spoke of a soldier who fought grimly. Wellington smiled at him and looked round the table. Captain Sharp has shared all my battles, gentlemen. Isn't that right, Sharp? From setting up a town to today. Since Boxtel, sir. Good God. <laughs> I was a lieutenant colonel. And I a private, sir. The aide-de-camp, the young aristocrats that Wellington liked as his messengers, stared curiously at the scarred face. Not many men fought out of the ranks. Hogan watched the general. He was being genial to Sharp, not because the rifleman had once saved his life— but because he suspected that in Sharp he had found an ally against the engineer's caution. Hogan sighed inwardly. Wellington knew this man. The general looked round the room. A chair for Captain Sharp. Lieutenant Sharp, sir. Sharp's words were almost a challenge, certainly bitter, but the general ignored them. Sit down, sit down. Now, tell us about the breaches. Sharp told them. Not awed by the company, but he added little to Fletcher's account. He had not been able to see clearly. The darkness was relieved only by a very occasional gun flash from the city's walls, and much of his account was based on the sounds he had heard as he lay on the glass's lip and listened, not just to the French working parties, but to the British grape shots smashing through the weeds and rattling on the walls. Wellington let him finish. It had been a concise statement. The general's eyes held sharps. One question, sir. Are the breaches practical? Wellington's eyes were unreadable, cold like steel. Sharp's gaze was as hard as unyielding. Yes. A murmur round the table. Wellington leant back. Colonel Fletcher's voice rose above the noise. With respect, my lord, I don't think it was then Captain uh, Lieutenant Sharp's competency to pronounce on a breach. He's been there. Fletcher muttered something about sending a heathen to Kirk and not making him a Christian, 
The quill in his hand bent almost double under the pressure of his fingers. He let it go, and the split nib spattered ink across the two bastions. He thumped the pen down. That's too soon! Wellington pushed himself away from the table, stood up. One day, gentlemen, one day. He looked round the table. No one challenged him. It was too soon. He knew that. But perhaps any day would be too soon to take on this fortress. Perhaps, as the French claimed, it was impregnable. Tomorrow, gentlemen, Sunday the 5th, we assault Barajod. Sir? Sharp spoke, and the general, who had been expecting a protest from the engineers, turned towards him. Sharp? One question, sir. Sharp could hardly believe that he was talking, let alone in such challenging tones and in such a company, but he might not get this chance again. Go on. The hope, sir. I'd like to lead the hope. Wellington's eyes were cold and glinting. Why? What was he to say? That it was a test? The supreme test, perhaps, of a soldier? Or that he wanted his revenge on a system, a system represented by a pox scarred clerk in Whitehall, that had made him superfluous, unwanted? He suddenly thought of Antonia, his daughter, of Teresa. He thought that he might never see Madrid, Paris, or know how the war would end, but the die was cast. He shrugged looking for words, unsettled by the impenetrable eyes. But I don't know, sir. I want it. He sounded to himself like a petulant child. He could sense the eyes of the senior officers on him, curious eyes, looking at his shabby uniform, his old irregular sword, and he damned them to hell. Their pride was buttressed by money. Wellington's voice was softer. You want your company? Yes, sir. He felt a fool, a shabby fool in a glittering setting, and he knew that all of them could see his broken pride. Wellington nodded towards Colonel Fletcher. The colonel will tell you, Sharp, and pray God he's wrong, that on Monday morning we'll be handing captaincies out with the rations. Fletcher said nothing. The room was silent, embarrassed by Sharp's request. The rifleman felt as if all his life, all that had been and all that might never be, was balanced on this silence. Wellington smiled. God knows, Sharp, that I think you're a rogue. A useful rogue, and thankfully a rogue was on my side. He smiled again, and Sharp knew that the general was remembering the gory Indian bayonets reaching for him at a say. But that debt had long been paid. Wellington picked up his papers. I don't think I want you dead, Sharp. The army would be somehow less interesting. Your request is denied. He left the room. Sharp stood there quite still as the other officers filed out, and he thought how in these past few miserable weeks he'd fixed all his hopes and ambitions on that one thing. His captaincy, his company, their jackets, rifles and trust, even because he didn't seriously believe he'd be killed, the chance to reach the house with the two orange trees before the maniacal horde, before Hegswell, and all had been fixed on the hope, the forlorn hope, and it had been denied. He should have felt disappointment, anger even, at the refusal, but he could not. Instead, flooding through him like pure water scarring a foul ditch, was relief, utter blissful relief. He was ashamed of the feeling. Hogan came back into the room and smiled up at him. There, if asked, he got the right answer. No. Sharp's face was stubborn. There's still time, sir. Still time. He didn't know what he meant, or why he said it, except that on the morrow, in the first darkness of evening, he would somehow face that test and win. Chapter 22 Sergeant Obadiah Hakeswell was feeling contented. He sat by himself, church parade done, and stared into the depths of his shako. He spoke to his hat. Tonight it is. Tonight. Uh, I'll be a good boy. I won't let you down. He cackled, showing his few rotting teeth, and looked round the company. They were watching him, he knew, but would take care not to catch his eye. He looked back into the greasy depths of the hat. Scared they are of me. Oh, yes, scared of me. Be more scared tonight. A lot of them will die tonight. He cackled again and raised his eyes fast, so that he might catch a man staring at him. They were all studiously avoiding his eyes. You'll die tonight, like, like big old bloody pigs under the pole axe. 
he would not die. He knew it, despite what Sharp had said. He looked back into the Shaco. Bloody Sharp, he's scared of me. He ran away. He can't kill me. No one can kill me. He almost shouted the last words. They were true. He had been touched by death and he had survived. He reached up and scratched the livid red scar. He had hung for an hour on the gallows, a scrap of a boy, and no one had pulled his feet so that his neck would snap. He didn't remember much of the experience, the crowds, the other prisoners who had joked with him, but he'd always be grateful to the sadistic bastard who had hung them the slow way, without a drop, so that the crowd would have a spectacle to watch. They had cheered every spasmodic jerk and useless struggle, until the executioner's assistants, grinning like actors who are pleasing their audience, came to hold the dangling ankles. They had looked at the crowd, asking their permission to pull and tease the prisoners. They hadn't bothered with the twelve-year-old Obadiah Hexwell. He was cunning then as now, and had hung still, even as the pain drifted him in and out of consciousness, so the crowd thought he was already dead. He hadn't known why he clung so tenaciously to life. It would have been faster and far less painful to be ankle-tugged to death. But then the rain had come. The clouds had split apart in a downpour that cleared the streets in minutes and no one could be bothered with the last small body. His uncle, furtive and frightened, had cut him down and hurried the limp body into an alleyway. He'd slapped Obadiah's face. Listen, you bastard, can you hear me? Obadiah must have said something, or moaned, because he remembered his uncle's face peering close. You're alive, understand, little bastard? I don't know why I bothered, except your mother wanted me to. Can you hear me? Yes. His face was twitching, and he couldn't stop it. You're to bugger off, understand? Just bugger off. If you can't go home, they'll get you again. You, you, you hear me? He had heard and understood, and buggered off, and never saw his family again. Not that he missed them much. He'd found the army, like so many hopeless men, and it had served him well. And he could not die. He'd known it since he was alone in the alleyway, had tested it in battle, and he knew that he had cheated death. He unsheathed his bayonet and wondered for a second whether to give it to one of the privates to sharpen. He'd like to humiliate the big Irish bastard, but on the other hand he always liked to do the job himself when there was killing ahead. The assault would happen today. Everyone knew it, though no announcement had been made, and there'd be killing enough for everyone. He looked into the hat. Well, you'll excuse me a moment. I'll talk again soon. He put the shako down and picked up his stone. It blurred in his hand, holding the bayonet's leading edge, but he did not look at the work. He stared instead at the company, recognizing their fear and feeding from it. Hexwell was content. He had broken the bastards until they fetched his food, washed his clothes, and changed the straw in his shelter. Two of them he'd beaten into pulp, but now they were like puppy dogs, eager to please. He'd won his major battles, Sharp was out of the way, and Harper was broken down into a private, a red-coated private. The captain was afraid of Hexwell, so was Price, and so were the sergeants. Life could be, Hexwell knew, a lot worse. He put a thumb on the blade, knew the edge could be sharper, and the stone started again on long, whispering strokes. Private Clayton looked sideways at Hexwell, laughed and said something to his companion. Hexwell saw the laugh, but pretended not to notice. He'd take care of young Clayton, but after the siege, when he had time to think the problem through. Clayton had a pretty wife, the prettiest in the battalion, and Hexwell had his eye on Sally. She'd have to wait until he had done with Teresa. The thought of Sharp's woman made him scowl. He wasn't certain why he wanted her so much, but he did. She'd become an obsession that disturbed his sleep. He would take the bitch and kill her afterwards. It wasn't because she'd fought him and won. Others had done that. He remembered the woman in Dublin who'd stuck a gutting knife in his belly. She had got away and he'd felt no resentment, but Teresa was different. Perhaps it was because she'd shown no fear, and Hexwell liked to see fear. He could remember the ones he'd killed, the ones he'd not needed to kill, right back to that prig of a vicar's daughter who'd stripped for him as he held the adder close by her neck. Dorcas, that was her name, and her father had trumped up a sheep-stealing charge that had nearly killed him. Hexwell smiled to himself. He'd burned down the vicar's tithe barn on his first night after the hanging. He thought again at Teresa, and the edge of his bayonet became sharper, and he knew that he wanted her very much. 
not just for revenge, not just because she was Sharp's woman, though that was important, but because he wanted her. She was so beautiful, so utterly beautiful. And he would take her, kill her, and the bastard Sharp would lose her. The anticipation brought on his involuntary twitch. He changed hands so that the bayonet was in his right hand and, wedging the stone between his knees, he spat on it and began on the point. It would be needle-sharp when he'd finished, so sharp that it would slide sweetly into a man's guts as if there was no skin to puncture on the way. More a woman's. He cackled aloud at the thought, alarming the company, and he thought of Teresa. Sharp would know who'd done it. There was nothing he could do about it. Hexwell could not be killed. He looked up at the company. They wanted to kill him, he knew, but so had the men of a dozen other companies, and all had tried. He could remember the musket balls going past him in battle, fired from behind, and once he'd seen a man taking deliberate aim. He stroked the bayonet, remembering his revenge, and then thought of the night ahead. He'd planned his assault carefully. The South Essex, with the rest of the 4th Division, would be attacking the breached face of the Trinidad Bastion, but Hexwell would take care in the ditch. He'd hang back. Let others do the fighting, so that he was fresh when the cheers came from the top of the breach. Then, when the chaos started, he'd cross the wall and go up into the dark streets that led to the cathedral. He only needed two minutes' lead, which was all he was likely to get, but he knew as he tested the perfectly prepared blade in his hands that he would succeed. He always did succeed. He'd been touched by death, released, and he felt in his soul that he'd been inspired to succeed ever since. He looked up. Clayton! The company froze and stared at Clayton. The young private grinned as if he wasn't worried. Sergeant? Oil. Get me oil. Yes, Sergeant. Hexwell cackled as the boy walked away. He'd save him for after Barachov, after the killing, for the time when he would have to pick up the other problems that he'd deferred. There was the oilskin bundle that was buried beneath a boundary stone two miles down the Seville Road. Hexwell had visited the spot last night, heaved the stone off the field embankment, and rummaged through the stolen goods. It was all safe, and he'd left most of it there because there'd be no point in trying to sell anything in the next few days. Barachoth would be stuffed with loot. Prices would drop to rock bottom. It could all wait. He'd only taken Sharp's telescope, with its distinctive brass plate, which he planned to leave beside Therese's body. He picked up his hat, stared down into the interior. Then he'll be blamed, won't he? Or else that bastard Irishman. Sergeant? The eyes rolled up. Private Clayton? Well, the oil, Sergeant. Well, don't bloody stand there. Hexwell held up his bayonet. Oil it. And be careful, don't spoil the edge. He let Clayton walk away and then looked down into the hat. Nasty little boy. Perhaps he'll die tonight, and that'll make things easier for us. Harper watched the twitching, malevolent face and wondered what was inside the Shaco. The whole company wondered, but no one dared ask. It was Harper's opinion that there was nothing inside, that the whole performance was a contrived demonstration of madness to unsettle the company. The Irishman sharpened his own bayonet, the unfamiliar musket bayonet that lacked the rifle blade's handle, and he made his own plans for the night. There were still no orders, but the army, with its strange collective instinct, knew that the assault was planned, and if, as seemed likely, the South Essex were ordered into the breach, Harper intended staying close to Hexwell. If a chance came to kill the sergeant, he would, or else he had tried to make sure that Hexwell did not slip alone into the city. Harper had decided not to volunteer for the hope, not unless Hexwell volunteered, and he thought that unlikely. Harper's job was to protect Teresa, as it was Sharp's, the whole company's. Even Captain Robert Knowles, who'd visited his old like company and listened seriously as Harper told of Hexwell's threat. Knowles had grinned, reassured Harper, but still the Irishman feared the consequences of the chaos in a breach. He leant back and listened to the guns. The gunners, with the same instinctive knowledge that the assault was imminent, served their guns with extra effort, as if each stone shard chipped from the breaches would save an infantryman's life. The smoke from the twelve batteries hung like a sea fog above the still waters of the flooded stream. Smoke so thick that the city could hardly be seen. And more smoke was pumped relentlessly from the huge guns. 
The cannon were like bucking monsters that hissed and steamed between each shot, as the blackened gunners sponged and rammed, then heaved the beasts back onto target. The gunners couldn't see the breaches, but the wooden recall platforms were marked with deep cuts, and the officers and sergeants lined the gun trails on the cuts, checked the elevation screw. With a flick of the glowing match, the gun would bellow again, leap back, and a heavy iron ball would vanish in the fog with a sudden whirl of smoke that was followed by the grinding crash of impact. Perhaps it was the temper of the guns that made the men so certain that the assault was this Sunday night, or else the sight of newly made siege ladders in the engineer's park. Two of the attacks, the one on the castle and the one by the river at the San Vincente Bastion, would carry ladders to try a surprise escalade. It could not work, of course. The walls were too high. The battle would be lost or won in the breaches. Gobbity! Axwell's voice grated at them. On your feet! They scrambled to their feet, pulling jackets straight. A Major Collip was there with Captain Rymer. The Major waved the men down again. You can sit. This had to be the announcement, Harper thought, and he watched as Collard drew out a sheet of paper and unfolded it. There was a buzz of excitement in the company, a shout for silence from Hegsville, and Collard waited for quiet. He looked at them belligerently. The assault, he said, would be soon, but they knew that, and they waited for orders. The Major paused and looked down at the piece of paper. His order has come, and I will read it to you. You will listen. I advert the army's attention to the events pursuant to the capture of Ciudad Rodrigo. Collett read in a flat, hard voice. He could not pronounce Ciudad with a soft C, so instead pronounced it Ciudad. The inhabitants of that town, citizens of Britain's allies, Spain, were offered every kind of insult and injury. There will be no repetition of that behavior in Barajov. Any attacks on civilian property will be swiftly and condignly punished by death the apprehended perpetrators being hung at the place of their crime. He folded the paper. You understand? Keep your thieving hands to yourself, and your breeches buttoned. That's all. He glared at them, turned on his heel, and marched away to the next company. The light company looked at each other, shrugged, and laughed at the message. Who would do the hanging? The provost would not be far to the front in any fighting. It would be pitch dark in the streets, and a soldier deserved some loot for fighting through a breach. They were the ones who would do the fighting and the dying, and who didn't need a drop of drink after that? Not that they intended any harm to any civilians. The Spanish, most of whom in Barajoz were on the enemy's side, could choose for themselves how they welcomed the victors. They could leave their doors open and the drink on the table, or they could choose to be unfriendly. In which case, they grinned and went back to sharpening the seventeen-inch blades. A few moments later, a second rumor arrived, as strong as the first which had announced the assault, and this rumour, flashing through the camp, brought relief and frustration. Everything was postponed. They'd all been given another twenty-four hours to live. "'Where are we going?' someone shouted. They laughed, forgetting Hegsville's baleful presence. "'Barachov! Tomorrow!' Chapter 23 Suddenly there was optimism. Hogan's face, so long lined with concern, crinkled at the eyes. There was an urgency in his speech, a new hope. Two loyal Spaniards had escaped from the city, climbing the wall by the river, and had safely reached the British lines. Hogan's finger stabbed down onto the familiar map. There, Richard, there. Tomorrow we'll destroy it. The finger was pointing towards the wall between the two breached bastions. The Spaniards said it was weak, that it hadn't been repaired properly after the previous sieges, and they swore that a few shots would bring the wall tumbling down. It would be a third breach, a sudden breach, a gap that the French would have no time to fill with careful defences. Ogun's fist slammed onto the map. We've got them. Tomorrow, then. Tomorrow. April the 6th dawned with a clear sky, and a light so pure that before the siege batteries opened fire, the city could be seen with every roof, church, tower, and bastion delicately etched. It was a spring morning, full of hope as green as the new plants, a hope put there by a third surprise breach. The gunners made their minimal adjustment, the trails inching around on the platforms, and then the order was given. Smoke jetted, thunder echoed over the lake, the balls smashed at the repaired masonry as the gunners slaved, dragged at their weapons, rammed, sponged, and rammed again, working with a knowledge of victory. 
To the south, clear of the smoke fog on the lake, the engineers peered at the unbroken stretch of wall. It jetted dust in a hazy cloud, started from the dry mortar by the cannon strike, but it held all morning. The cannons hammered on, smiting the wall with shattering force until early in the afternoon the labour was rewarded. The wall began to slide, not piece by piece as the bastions had given, but in one solid spectacular chunk. Hogan jumped for the joy of it. It's going! Then the view was lost. Dust boiled up like smoke from an explosion, the sound rolled across the water, and the gun crews cheered themselves hoarse. The dust drifted slowly away, and there, where once there had been a seemingly solid wall, was now a third huge breach, as wide as the others, but fresh, undefended, and the orders were given. Tonight, gentlemen, tonight at dusk, into the breaches, and the gates of Spain would belong to Britain. All afternoon, as clouds came from the east, the guns fired so that the French could not work in the breaches. The gunners worked willingly. Their job was done, and this was the last day of effort, the twenty-second day of the siege, and tomorrow there would be no more heaving and sweating and no more enemy counter-battery fire. Arachov would be theirs. The engineers countered ladders and hay bags, stacked the huge axes that the leading troops would take into the attack, and thought of the comfortable beds that waited in the city. Barachov was theirs. The orders, just twenty-seven paragraphs, were issued at last, and the men listened in silence as their officers told them the news. Bayonets were polished again, muskets checked, and they listened to the flat notes of the cathedral clock. First darkness, and Barachov was theirs. Captain Robert Knowles, now part of the Third Division, stared up at the huge castle with its colony of kestrels. The third division, carrying the longest ladders, was to cross the stream and climb the castle rock. No one expected the attack to work. It was merely a diversion to keep troops pinned in the castle. But Knowles's men grinned at him and swore they would climb the wall. We'll show him, sir. And they would try, he knew. And so would he. And he thought how splendid it would be if he could reach Teresa first, in the house with two orange trees, and hand her and the child safely to Sharp. He looked again at the vast castle on its high, steep rock, and he vowed he would fight as sharp fought. The devil with a fake attack, they would attack for real. The 5th Division, brought back across the river, would mount another escalade with ladders, this time against the northeast bastion, the San Vincente, which towered above the slow river. Like the castle attack, it was intended to pin down enemy troops, so stop reinforcements going to the southeast corner but it was there at the three breaches that Wellington knew he must win his victory. The breaches. The fourth and light divisions would make the real attack, the assault on the three breaches, and the men, waiting as the clouds spread over the sky, imagined the boiling of troops in the ditch, the fighting that was to come. But they would win. Barachov would be taken. The guns fired on. Sharp found a cavalry armorer who put the huge sword against a treadled wheel, and the sparks flowed from the edge. He checked his rifle and loaded the seven-barrel gun. Even though his own orders forbade him to go into the ditch, he wanted to be ready. He was a guide, the only man who'd already walked the lip of the glasses, and his task was to lead the forlorn hope of the light division to the brink of the ditch opposite the Santa Maria bastion. There they would leave him and go on to attack the bastion and the new breach, while, off to the right, the South Essex and the 4th Division marched on the Trinidad. Once Sharp had taken the forlorn hope to the ditch, he was to return and guide other battalions up the slope. But he hoped against hope that he could find a way into the fight and over the wall to his child. The bell tolled six, then the quarter, and on the half the men lined up out of sight of the city. They carried no packs, just weapons and ammunition, and their colonels inspected them, not to check on uniforms, but to grin at them and encourage them, because tonight the common man, the despised soldier, would write a page in history and that page had better be a British victory. Tension stretched as the sun sank, imagination making fears real, and the officers passed the rum rations down the ranks and listened to the old jokes. There was a sudden warmth in the army, a feeling of difficulties that would be shared, and the officers who came from the big houses felt close to their men. Imagination did not spare the rich, nor were the defenders, and tonight the rich and poor in the ditch would need each other. The wives made their farewells and hoped for a live husband on the morrow, and the children were silent, awed by the expectancy 
while in the doctor's tents the instrument cases were opened and the scalpels honed. The guns fired on. Seven o'clock. A half hour only left, and Sharp and the other guides, all except the riflemen were engineers, joined their battalions. The forlorn hope of the light division was half composed of riflemen, hoping for the laurel wreath badge. They grinned at Sharp and joked with him. They wanted the thing done and over in the way that a man facing the surgeon's knife hastened the fatal clock. They'd move at half past seven, and by half past nine the issue would be decided. Those that lived would be drunk by ten, and the wine would be free. They waited, sitting on the ground with their rifles between their knees, and prayed the clock on. Let it be over. Let it be over. And darkness came, and the guns boomed on, and the orders had to come. Half past seven and the orders still not given. There was a delay, and no one knew why. The troops fidgeted, grew angry against unseen staff officers, cursed the bloody army and the bloody generals, because in the darkness the French would be swarming on the breaches, preparing traps for the British. The guns stopped firing, as they should have done, but there were still no orders, and the men waited and imagined the French working on the new breach. Eight o'clock sounded, and then the half, and horses galloped in the darkness. Men shouted for information. There were still no orders, but rumoured explanations. The ladders had been lost. The hay bags were missing, and they cursed the engineers, the lousy army, and the French worked on. Nine o'clock, a murder was being prepared in the breaches. Delay it, Sharp thought. Let it be tomorrow. The attack should go in on the heels of the guns, in the minutes of darkness, when there was a trace of light— so that the battalions would not get lost on the glasses. Still the time ticked away, and still they waited, and still the enemy were given precious minutes to work on the defences. Then there was a stir in the darkness. Orders at last, and there would be no delay. Go! 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 The ranks moved with the clinking of metal and thumping of rifle and musket stocks. There was a sense of relief to be moving in the darkness, in the bleak, total darkness, and the six thousand five hundred men, English, Irish, Scottish, Welsh, and Portuguese, moved against the city. The guides ordered quiet, and the orders went back, but they were moving at last, and no one could silence the thousands of boots that scraped and scuffed by the road that led between the flood and the Pardaleras fort. Far to the north, the third division filed over the bridge by the broken mill that spanned the Rebilias, and the air was filled with the croaking of frogs and the fears of men. The city waited in darkness, silence in Badajoz. The lieutenant who was leading the forlorn hope touched Sharp's elbow. Are we too far to the left? They'd all lost touch with the 4th Division. It was dark, utterly dark, and there was no sound from the fort or from the city. Sharp whispered back, We're all right. Still there was no firing. No sound from the city or from the Pardaleris that was now behind them. Silence. Sharp wondered if the attack would be a surprise to the French. He wondered if perhaps the enemy had been fooled by the delay. Perhaps the troops had relaxed, were waiting for another day. And if the greatest gift the gods can give a soldier, surprise had been given to the British. They were close now. The dim, dark shadow of the fortress blotted out half the sky. It was huge in the night, vast, unimaginably strong, and the slope of the glacis was beneath Sharp's feet, and he paused as the sixty men of the forlorn hope aligned themselves and thrust their ladders and hay bags to the front. The lieutenant scraped his sword from the scabbard. Ready! There was firing from the right, far off, where the third division had been spotted. It sounded miles away, like someone else's battle, and it was difficult to believe that the sound had anything to do with the dark glasses leading to the fortress in front. Yet the sound would alert all the French sentries, and Sharp hurried up the slope, angling to his left and still there was no sound from walls or bastions. He tried to make sense of the shadows, to recognize the shapes he had seen just three nights before, and his footsteps sounded loud on the grass, and he could hear the panting of men behind him. Surely the French would hear. At any moment he almost cringed at the reality of the imagination. The grape shop would stab down from the walls. He saw the corner of a bastion, recognized the Santa Maria, and a relief went through him as he knew he'd brought the hope to the right place. Sharp turned to the lieutenant. This is it. He wished he was going with him, that he was leading the hope, but it was not to be. The glory belonged to the lieutenant, who made no reply. Tonight he was a god. Tonight he could do no wrong. 
because tonight he was leading a forlorn hope against the biggest citadel the British army had ever attacked. He turned to his men. They went. Silent. The ladders scraped over the stone lip of the glasses, down into the ditch, and the men scrambled down, slithering on the rungs, falling onto the thrown hay bags. It had begun. Sharp watched the walls. They were dark and silent. Behind him at the foot of the glasses, he could hear the tramp of feet as the battalions approached, and then, ahead, he heard the lieutenant shout at his men, and the first scrambling of boots on the breach. It had started. Hell had come to Barajov. Chapter 24 In the cathedral that day the prayers had been unceasing, muttered, sometimes hysterical. The words had accompanied the beads as the women of Barajov feared for the dead who would come to their streets that night. Just as the British army knew the assault was coming, so too did the defenders and inhabitants of Barajov. A host of candles flickered before the saints, as if the tiny flames could keep at bay the evil that surrounded the city, and came pressing closer as the night gloom filled the cathedral. Rafael Moreno, merchant, trickled powder into his pistols and hid them, loaded and primed, beneath the lid of his writing desk. He wished his wife were with him, but she'd insisted on joining the nuns in the cathedral, foolish woman, and praying. Prayers would not deflect the soldiers. Bullets might, but it was more likely they could be bribed by the cheap red wine he'd put in his courtyard. Moreno shrugged. The most valuable possessions were hidden, well hidden, and his niece insisted she had friends among the British. He could hear Teresa upstairs, talking to her child, and doubtless she had the heathen rifle loaded and ready. He liked his niece, of course, but there were times when he thought that his brother Cesar's family were more than a little too wild. Downright irresponsible, even. He poured himself wine. That child upstairs, improving in health, God be praised, but a bastard. And in his house. Moreno sipped the wine. The neighbours didn't know. It seemed to that. They thought she was a widow whose husband had died in last year's battles between the French and the disintegrating Spanish armies. He heard the clock and the cathedral tower begin wheezing as it wound itself up to strike the bell. Ten o'clock in Barajov. He emptied his glass and called for a servant to refill it. The bell sounded, and below, in the cathedral, beneath the vaulted ceiling and the gold ledges, below the huge, dark chandelier, and beneath the sad eyes of the Virgin, the women heard the crackle of muskets begin far away. They looked up, over the glow of the candles, at the Mother of God. Be with us now, and in the hour of our need. Sharp heard the first toll of the hour, and then no more. As it sounded, so the first fireball rose from the battlements, arced its spark path in the blackness, and then plummeted to the ditch. It was the first of a storm, the tight-packed balls flaming and falling as the carcasses were rolled onto the breach, and suddenly the breaches, the ditch, the ravelin, the obstacles, and the tiny figures of the forlorn hope were swamped in light. Light poured from above by flames that caught on the obstacles in the ditch and the hope began to climb as the fire was bright on their bayonets. The battalions behind cheered. Silence was done. The front ranks reached the ditch and the ladders scraped over. Men hurled themselves after their hay bags and scrambled down ladders, a flow of men in desperate haste to cross the ditch and climb the huge ramps of the breaches. They were cheering, urging themselves on, even as the first tongues of quicksilver flame raced down the breaches of the Santa Maria and Trinidad. Sharp dropped as the mines exploded. Not one or two, but tons of powder packed in the ditch on the lower slopes of the ramps was ignited and exploded outwards, and the forlorn hope was gone, taken in an instant, ground into fragments of wet horror, all dead as the first files of the first battalions were hurled backwards by the flame and flying stone. The French cheered. They lined the parapets, the bastions, and the guns that had been handed round to fire down into the ditch, guns which had been double-shotted with canister, were unmasked. Muskets spat, were drowned by the cannon flames. The enemy cheered and shouted obscenities, and all the time the carcasses were thrown, lighting the targets, and the ditch was slopping with fire, a container of flames that would only be drowned in blood, and still the men went down the ladders and into the ditch. The third breach was silent the new breach. 
It lay between the bastions, a huge fresh scar that could lead into the city. But Sharp saw the French had worked well. The ditch in front of the wall was huge, as wide as a parade ground, but filled with the squat, half-finished ravelin. The ravelin was twenty feet high, shaped like a diamond, and the only way to the new breach was to go round it. The way was blocked. Carts had been tipped over in the approach ditches, then covered with timbers, and the fireballs had lit the obstacles so that they flamed huge and fierce, and no attacker could get close. Only the breaches in the bastions, the Santa Maria and the Trinidad, could be approached, and those were dominated by the enemy guns. They fired again and again. The ammunition hoarded against this night, and still the British tried, and still they died, yards from the breach's base. Sharp went back down the glasses into the shadows, and turned once to see the high great walls of the battle lit by fire. Flames jetted from the embrasures, writhing smoke into the maelstrom below, and in the light of the fires he saw strange patterns at the top of the breaches. He stopped and stared, trying to make sense of the shapes glimpsed through the harrowing fire and smoke, and saw that the French had crowned each breach with chevaux de frise. Each one was a timber, thick as a battleship's main mast, and from each chain timber there sprang a thousand sabre blades. The blade barrier, thick as a porcupine's coat, to hook and tear any man who reached the summit, if any did. He found the colonel of his next battalion, standing with drawn swords, staring at the fire-edge glasses. The colonel glared at Sharp. What's happening? Gun, sir, come on. Not that the colonel needed to be told or to be guided— the face of the Santa Maria Bastion was a sheet of reflected flame, and they marched toward it as suddenly the canister whistled down the slope and cut huge swathes through the battalion. The men closed ranks, marched on nearer the lip, and the gunners doused the glasses with bursting canister, and the colonel waved his sword. Come on! They ran, order disappearing, and hurled themselves at the ditch. Bodies littered the glasses, twitched by new blasts of shot and still more men climbed the slope and poured into the vast fireball. Men jumped towards haybags and landed instead on the dead or wounded. The living pushed forward towards the breach, trying to claw their way to the shattered stone, and each time the French gunners, high on the terrifying walls, swatted them back so that the ditch floor was thick with blood. Sharp watched appalled. His orders were to go back to where the reserve waited, to guide more men forward, but no man needed to be guided this night. He stayed. Not one man had reached a breach. The ditch between the glasses and the ravelin was black with men, disorganized men, the mingling of the fourth and light divisions. Some cowered there for safety, thinking the shadow of the ravelin would give them protection from the guns that scorched down at them. But there was no safety. The guns could reach every inch of the ditch, firing in scientific patterns, killing, killing, killing. But for the moment they fired only where the British moved, towards the breaches and the spaces before the great stone ramps were thickening with dead. The guns fired canister, tin cans that burst apart in the muzzle flame and scattered musket balls like giant duck shot, while other guns were loaded with grape shot, naval ammunition, that rattled against the ditch wall. It wasn't just the guns. The defenders hurled anything that would kill from the ramparts. Stone lumps the size of a man's head crashed down into the ditch. Gun shells, their fuses cut to a quarter inch and lit by hand, fizzed down and sent red-hot fragments scything on the ditch's floor, and even kegs of powder, fused and lit, were rolled down the breach slope. Sharp watched one barrel bouncing and tumbling, its fuse spinning madly red, finally leap into the ditch and explode in the face of a dozen riflemen who were running for the Santa Maria breach. Only three lived, blinded and screaming, and one of them wandered, insensate with pain, into the burning timbers that blocked the path to the new breach. Sharp fancied he could hear the man's dying screams bubble with the flames, but there were so many dying and so much noise that he couldn't be certain. The noise of the living in the ditch was a growl, and suddenly it rose to a sound of fury, and Sharp looked right to see a wave of men, riflemen and red jackets, charging forward. He groaned. They had stormed their way up the ravelin's sloping face, desperate for victory, and the burgeoning attack spread out on the diamond's top flat surface and ran with level bayonets towards the new breach. The French were waiting. Guns that hadn't fired were touched with flame. The grape shot ripped in from three sides, and the attack died in a dancing horror as men were struck as by contrary iron winds. A few lived, 
ran on and found that the ravine led to another sheer drop, into another ditch before the breach, and as they hesitated, the French infantry dropped them with musket fire, and there was nothing but bodies left on the ravelin's top, bodies that had fallen and left unrecognizable dark smears on the stone. The guns were winning the night. The ditch was blocked by fire. Men could not go right or left because of the flaming timbers that jammed the main ditch on either side of the two bastions, just as the approaches to the third breach were blocked. The four fires, fed with fresh timber from the walls, defined where the British could go, a space that was terrible with gunfire. Yet still more men went over the edge, hurrying down the ladders, as if there was some safety in the milling, scrambling horde that bulged at the edges as fresh groups charged towards a breach. The ditch was filling with men, hundreds and hundreds of men, shouting men, holding their bayonets above the crush, and the grape shop would lick down and clear a space of the living, and the space would be filled again as men trampled the dying. The guns would belch again and again, and the metal scraps turned the ditch into a charnel house. Still they went forward, incoherently brave, trying to reach an enemy they couldn't see or touch, and they died as they cursed and struggled forward. They went in small groups, and Sharp, crouched on the glasses, watched as an officer or sergeant led them forward. Mostly they died in the ditch, but some at last reached the breach and clambered upwards. A dozen men would go, and in seconds there'd be six, and three would reach the stone and begin to climb while the men on the glasses slip, next to Sharp, knelt up and fired their muskets at the walls, as if they could clear the path for the scrambling men. Sharp wondered if the French were playing with them. Sometimes no gun would fire on the small desperate groups, even though guns swept the approach to the breach, and he would watch them struggle higher and higher until, casually almost, the enemy would pluck them off the stone, tumble them dead, and a new high-tide mark of blood was marked on the breach. Once a man even reached the chevaux de frise. He swept at the sabre blades with a musket, bellowing defiance, and then he was hit by an unseen French infantryman, and he fell, twisting like a rag doll, down the slope, and the French jeered him and poured fire down. Sharp went right, looking for the 4th Division and the South Essex, but the ditch was a massive sink of death, of weird shadows cast by the fires, and he could make out no faces in the packed crowd that was filling the space between the ravelin and glasses. Men sheltered behind parapets made from the dead, others clumsily reloaded muskets and fired them uselessly at the towering stone that crushed them with fire. He ran for a minute, right on the edge of the glasses, stumbling on the uneven paving, and hearing the canister above him, in front of him, yet he was untouched. Small groups of men were on the glasses slip, light companies mostly, who rammed and fired, rammed and fired, hoping that their bullets might ricochet from an embrasure and kill a Frenchman. The canister flung them backwards, ragged down the slope, and beyond the bodies in the darkness, more men waited for the orders that would send them running to the light to the ditch, to the hundreds of dead. Sharp had never seen so many dead. He was still fifty yards from the Trinidad, but he could see that its breach was no better than the Santa Maria. The foot of the breach was smeared with bodies, its approaches bare of the living, though small groups of men dashed from the shadows of the ravelin and screamed defiance as they clawed at the stones and were blasted away. Bugles sounded to the right, the shouts of officers and sergeants, and there was the South Essex. He saw them flowing up the glasses in close column, and his company, Rhymer's company, lined the ditch and fired their ineffectual muskets at the wall's height, while the other men scrambled at the ladders, flung themselves on hay bags, frantic in their haste. Men bunched at the ditch's edge, the guns hammered from the wall, their hot breath hard on the glasses, and Sharp saw the battalion shudder like a wounded thing, reform, smash itself under new impacts. But they were over, scrambling in the ditch, and he saw Wyndham, his cocked hat gone, scything his sword towards the breach, and new guns fired until the sound of the city was like a weight of solid thunder. They died in dozens, but still they went towards the breach, and more men came from the ditch, from other regiments, and they tried and pushed and fought, and scrambled up the stone till it seemed they had to win, for there wasn't enough shot in the world to kill so many men. The gunners rammed and fired, loaded and fired, and the powder kegs banged down the slope, and the shells were thrown, fuses lit, so the dark explosions splintered the men, and they died, and it was done. The dead choked the living. The breach had won. A few men, very few, still lived, and struggled upwards, shredding their hands on the nailed boards laid down the upper slope. 
and Sharp saw Loa, sword in hand, cigar inevitably between his teeth, look up into the night, so slow, and then he fell, tumbling, fell, screaming into the ditch. Her last man reached the sword blades, the very top. He clawed at them, blood on his hands, and then he shook, quivered, filled with a dozen bullets, and the highest man, dead on the Trinidad, slid down, blood on stone, till he was caught. The survivors were behind the rabbin, digging into the dead, and the French mocked them. Commander Barajov, English! Sharp had not been with them. He knelt, fired once at the wall, and watched the death of the battalion. Collet, Jack Collet, neck severed by a round shot, even Sterrett, poor worried Sterrett, a hero now, killed in the ditch at Barajov. Sir? A voice curiously calm in the torment of sound. Sir? He looked up. Daniel Hagman, strange in red coat, stood over him. He stood up. Daniel? You better come, sir. He went towards the light company, close to him now and still on the glasses, and he saw in the ditch where men had drowned in the deep water. The black humps of their bodies broke up the ripples in red and dark patterns. The guns were quieter now, saving their anger for the fools who would come from behind the ravelin. The breaches were empty of all but the dead. The huge fires roared, greedy for the lumber that was tossed from the walls, and an army was dying between their flames. Sir? Lieutenant Price, his eyes stark with the horror, ran to Sharp. Sir? What? Your company, sir. Mine? Price pointed. Rymer was dead. A tiny wound, an insignificant wound, red on his pale forehead. He lay backwards on the slope, arms wide, staring at nothing, and Sharp shuddered when he remembered how he'd wanted this company, and thus this man's death, and now it was given to him. So easy. It was all done. Out of the horror, the pulverizing fire and iron that smothered the southeast corner of Barajov, death had given Sharp back what had once been his. He could stay on the glasses, firing at the night, safe from the carnage, a captain again, the company his, and men would account him a hero because he'd lived through Barajov. A musket ball whirred past his head, making him jerk back, and there was Harper, the red jacket discarded, huge in a blood-stained shirt, and the Irish face was stone hard. What do we do, sir? Do? There was only one thing to do. A man didn't go into a breach to fight for a company, not even a captaincy. Sharp looked over the ditch, over the scarred ravelin, and there, untouched by blood, was the third breach, the new breach, the unattacked breach. A man went first into a breach for pride, nothing else, just pride. A poor reason, paltry even, but enough, perhaps, to win a city. He looked up at Harper. Sergeant, we're going to Barajov. Chapter 25 Captain Robert Knowles crossed the bridge by the ruined mill and wondered at the calmness of the night. Beneath him the Rebilia stream whispered from the dam. Ahead the huge castle blotted out the sky, and in the darkness it seemed impossible that men could dare hope escalate the giant bastion. Wind rustled the new foliage in the trees that grew precariously on the steep hill that led up to the castle. Behind Knowles came his company, carrying two ladders, and they paused with him at the foot of the slope, their excitement suppressed, and peered up at the looming walls. Bloody high! A voice came from the rear rank. Quiet! The engineer officer who was guiding the battalion was nervous, and Knowles became annoyed at the man's fidgeting. What's the matter? We're too far over. We must go right. They could not go right. There were too many troops crowding at the hill's base, and it would cause chaos if the battalions tried to realign themselves in the darkness. Knowles shook his head irritably. We can't. What's the problem? Well, that! The engineer pointed to his left. A huge shadow sprang from the dark rock high over them, a shadow with a crenellated outline, the bastion of San Pedro. Knowles's colonel appeared beside him. What's the problem? Knowles pointed to the bastion, but the colonel dismissed it. We must do what we can. Are you all right, Robert? Yes, sir. The colonel turned to the light company and raised his voice a little above a whisper. Enjoy yourself, lads! There was a growling from the ranks. They had been told that this attack was merely a diversion, not intended to succeed. 
But then General Picton had damned Wellington's eyes and said that the 3rd Division did not make fake attacks. The 3rd Division would go all the way, or not at all, and the men were determined to prove Picton right. Knowles, for the first time, felt the seeds of doubt. They must climb a hundred feet of almost sheer rock, and then put ladders against a wall that looked forty feet high, and all the time under the guns of the defenders. He thrust the doubts away, trying as he always did to emulate Sharp, but it was difficult, faced with the enormity of the castle, to feel confident. His worries were interrupted by hurrying footsteps, and one of Picton's aides was calling for the colonel. Here. Go, sir, and the general wishes you've got speed. I'd rather he wished me a case of his claret. The colonel slapped Knowles's shoulder. Off you go. Knowles couldn't draw his sabre. He needed both hands to cling to the rock hill, to pull himself up while his feet found desperate footholds. His captaincy was heavy on his shoulders. He hurried, wanting to stay ahead of his men, because he knew Sharp would lead, and he imagined, as he climbed, the first heavy musket balls plumping down to crash in the top of his skull. His men seemed to be so noisy. The ladders scraped on rock, on tree trunks, the musket stocks banged on stone, the feet clattered pebbles loose, but still the castle was silent, the great shadow unrelieved by the gun flames. Knowles found himself thinking of Teresa, inside the city, and hoping against all the evidence of the massive walls that he could reach her first. He wanted to do something for Sharp. Faster! The shout was from one of his sergeants, and Knowles, his thoughts elsewhere, snapped his head back and stared up. High above him, falling, falling, was the first carcass. The fire roared in the sky. It tumbled end over end, shedding sparks, and he watched, fascinated, as it plunged into a thorn tree that grew close by. The tree fled into flame and the first muskets banged from the castle wall. They seemed far away. Come on! More fireballs and carcasses fell from the ramparts. Some lodged in the narrow space by the wall's foot. Others fell in streaming shreds of fire down the rock slope, and took men with them, screaming as the flames captured them. But Knowles climbed on, and his men pressed behind. Faster! Faster! A cannon crashed out its load from the San Pedro bastion, and canister whipped through the trees and crackled on stone. There was a cry behind him, a shout of despair, and he knew a man had gone. But there was no time to worry about casualties, just to scramble upwards, the going easier as they neared the top, and Knowles felt the excitement of battle that would carry him past fear and into action. Keep going! The colonel, surprisingly agile for his years, overtook him and reached the space at the wall's base first. He leaned down and helped Knowles up. Get the ladders! The musket balls smacked down, but the shop was an awkward one for the defenders. They had to lean right over the battlements and shoot straight down, almost at random, into the flaring light at the bottom of the wall. The cannons were far more dangerous, shooting from the San Pedro and from a smaller bastion to Knowles's right, a bastion jutting from the castle wall. Canister scraped the wall, promising death to men on ladders, but that was a fear that had to be ignored. Here! The first ladder loomed over the rock slope, and Knowles ran to it, pulled it towards the wall, and more men were manhandling it, swinging it upwards, until it thumped against the battlements. The colonel waved them on. Good lads! The first one over gets the best whore in Badakhov! They cheered, and the colonel dropped, fell by a bullet from above, but they hardly noticed. Me first! Me, me first! Knowles pushed through, boyish in his excitement. He knew that Sharp would lead, and so must he and he scrambled up the rungs, wondering what a fool he was. But his legs pumped automatically, and it occurred to him with sudden horror that he hadn't even drawn his sabre. He looked up, saw the arms of defenders pushing at the ladder, and he began to fall sideways. He shouted a warning, let go, and thumped down into a press of men. Miraculously, not a single bayonet touched him. He picked himself up. You heard, sir? A sergeant looked worriedly at him. No, get it up! The ladder wasn't broken. Another canister splintered on the wall, the men swung the ladder again, and this time Knowles was not near enough to be first, and he watched as his men began climbing. The first was shot from above, thrown clear by the second man, more pushed behind, and then the whole ladder with its human cargo disintegrated in splinters and flesh as a barrel full of grape shot fired from the San Pedro bastion found a full target. Stones were being hurled from the castle parapets that crashed into knots of men and bounced down the rock face. Suddenly Knowles's company seemed to be halved in strength. He felt the frustrations of defeat and looked frantically for the second ladder. 
It had gone. Back down the slope. And then there were voices shouting at him, Back! Back! He recognized his major's voice, saw the face, and he jumped into the shadows and left behind the broken ladders and bodies of the first attack beneath the triumphant shouts of the enemy. Any news from the castle? No, no my lord. The generals fidgeted. In front of them, the southeast corner of Barachods flickered with bright fire. The two soaring bastions, scarred by the unconquered breaches, framed the flames, fed them, and the smoke boiled scarlet into the night. To the right, and seemingly far away, more fire glowed above the silhouetted castle, and Wellington, cloaked and gloved, tugged nervously at his reins. Picton won't do it, you know. He won't. An aide de camp leaned closer. Uh, my lord? Oh, nothing. Nothing. He was irritable, helpless. He knew what was happening in the great pit of fire ahead. His men were marching into it, and he couldn't get out the other side. He was appalled. The walls were three times bigger than Ciudad Rodrigo, the fight unimaginably worse. But he had to have the city. Chemis, from the 4th Division, pushed in by his side. My lord? General? Do we reinforce, sir? Chemis was hatless, his face smeared with dirt, as if he'd been firing a musket himself. Do we send in more men? Wellington hated sieges. He could be patient when he had to be, when he was enticing the enemy into a trap, but a siege was not like that. Inevitably this moment had to come, when the troops had to be ordered into the one small deadly point, and there was no escaping it, unless the enemy was simply starved into submission. There'd be no time for that. He had to have this city. Sharp! For a second the general was tempted to damn Sharp, who had assured him the breaches were practical. But Wellington suppressed the thought. The rifleman had said what Wellington had wanted him to say, and even if he hadn't, then Wellington would still have sent in the troops. Sharp. If Wellington had one thousand Sharps, then the city might be his. He listened gloomily to the sounds of battle. The French cheers were loud, and he knew they were beating him. He could withdraw now and leave the dead and wounded to be recovered under a flag of truce, or he could send in more men and hope to turn the battle. He had to have the city. Otherwise there could be no march on Spain this summer, no advance to the Pyrenees, and Napoleon would be given another year of power. Send them in. Feed the monster, he thought, that was grinding his army, his fine army, but the monster must be fed until it gave up. He could make up the shattered battalions. The reinforcements would come, but without Barakhov there was no victory. Damn the engineers! There were miners in Britain, hundreds in Cornwall alone, but none with the army, no corps of sappers, who could have tunnelled under the bastions, packed the cavern with powder and blown the French to kingdom come. He found himself wondering whether he should have slaughtered the garrison at Ciudad Rodrigo, whether he could have lined them up in tens and shot them, then left the bodies to rot in the town ditch so that any Frenchman who chose to contest another breach could only expect the terrible vengeance of the English. He couldn't have ordered it, any more than he would order it here if they won this night. If. He turned irritably towards his aides. His face was long and harsh-shadowed in the torchlight cast from Lord March's hand. Any news of the fifth? The answering voice was low, anxious not to add to the bad news. They should be attacking now, my lord. General Leith sends his apologies. God damn his apologies. Why can't he be on time? His horse shied, struck by a spent musket bullet, and the general soothed it. He could expect nothing of the escalades. Leith was late, and the garrison at San Vincente would be warned, while Picton was hoping for the moon if he thought he could lay his long ladders against the castle wall. Victory, he knew, would have to be carved here, at the southeast corner, where flame and smoke churned over the ghastly ditch. Distantly, like a reminder of another world echoing in the depths of hell, the cathedral bell tolled eleven, and Wellington looked up into the blackness and then back at the flames. One more hour, gentlemen, one more hour. And then what, he wondered. Failure? Hell was no place for miracles. On the walls the French gunners slackened their fire. They had drowned the ditch in death, and now they listened to the screams and moans that came from below. The attack seemed to have stopped, so the gunners stretched, soaked their faces with water splashed from the buckets used to wet the sponges, and watched as fresh ammunition was brought up the ramp. They didn't expect much more effort from the British. A few men had climbed the breaches, one was even impaled on the sabre-blades, but it was a hopeless effort. 
Poor bastards. There was no joy any longer in shouting insults. A sergeant, leather-skinned and hard, leant on a gunwale and flinched. Christ! I wish they'd stop screaming. A few men had lit surreptitious cigars that they hid from their officers by leaning deep into the gun embrasures. One man wriggled forward past the acrid muzzle until he could peer down into the ditch. The sergeant called wearily to him. Come back. Those rifle bastards will get you. The man stayed. He peered down, far down at the writhing horror in the ditch. He pulled himself back. If they get in, they'll bloody slaughter us. The sergeant laughed. They won't get in, lad. Not a chance. In two hours you'll be tucked in bed with that horrid thing you call a woman. You're jealous, sergeant. Me? <laughs> I'd rather go to bed with this. The sergeant slapped the barrel of his gun. The wreathed N, Napoleon's symbol, was searing hot. Now get back here, lad. Put that bloody cigar out and look smart. I might need you, God help me. A call from the observation point. Make ready! The sergeant sighed and stood up. Another tiny group of idiot British were running towards the Santa Maria breach, and his gun covered the approach. He watched them down the length of his glistening gun, saw them slip on blood, stumble on stone, and then they were in his target zone. He stood to one side, touched the match to the powder-filled reed, and the green-jacketed men were beaten into fragments. It was so easy. The sergeant bellowed orders for the reloading, listened to the hiss as the sponge seared down the bore, and was glad that he was at Balakoth this night. The French had begun to fear this Lord Wellington, to turn him into a bogeyman to frighten their sleep, and it was pleasing to show that the English lord could be beaten. The sergeant grinned as the bulbous lumps of canvas-wrapped grape-shot were rammed into the cannon. This night Wellington would taste defeat, utter defeat, and the whole empire would rejoice. This night belonged to France, only to France, and Britain's hopes were being buried where they belonged, in a ditch for the dead. Chapter 26 This way! This way! They were going right, away from the San Pedro Bastion, clawing a path on the hill's steep side until they'd turned a corner and would receive some shelter from the grape shot. The first attack had been horribly repulsed, but the third division would try again. They could hear the fury at the main breach far away, and see on the sheeted floodwaters the dim reflections of the fires that were consuming the light in fourth divisions. Knowles could feel a madness in the air, beating its dark wings against the city, bringing a night of insane death and crazy effort. Light company! Light company! Yes, sir. An old sergeant steadying his captain with a hand, and then a lieutenant leading a dozen men. My God, Knowles thought, is this all that is left? But then he saw more men tugging the cumbersome ladder. Another sergeant grinned at him. Here we go again, sir. Wait for the bugle. He knew there was no point in making a scattered attack that could be picked off piecemeal by the defenders. The whole division must go together. Noel suddenly felt good. There was an impression in his head, one that had been nagging him, and now he pinned it down. The musket fire had been light from the parapet. The grape shot had confused him, but now, thinking back to the chaos of the first attack, the shattering ladder... He remembered how few had been the musket flashes from the walls. The French must have left a skeleton garrison in the castle, and a confidence surged through him. They would do it. He grinned at his men, slapped their backs, and they were glad that he was confident. He was trying to think how Sharp would do this. The danger was not the muskets. The danger was from the defenders toppling the long rickety ladders. He ordered off a dozen men under the lieutenant and told them they were not to try and climb the ladder. Instead, they were to fire at the ladder's head, scar the parapet of its defenders, and only when the parapet was clear and he had led the men over the battlements were they to follow. Understand? They grinned and nodded, and he grinned back and drew the curved sabre from its scabbard. The sergeant laughed. I thought you were going to forget it again, sir. The men laughed at him, and he was glad of the darkness to cover his blush, but they were good men, his men, and he suddenly understood, as never before, the sense of loss that Sharp had suffered. Knowles wondered how he was to climb the ladder and hold the sword, and knew he'd have to put the blade between his teeth. But he'd drop it. He was nervous. But then, instead of bugles, there were shouts, and the trampling of feet, and the moment had come. The survivors of the third division erupted from the darkness. The carcasses flowed down, and the cannon in the small castle bastion shredded the attack. 
but they were screaming defiance, and the ladders swayed in the ungainly curves until they slammed against the castle wall. Up! He jammed the blade between his teeth and gripped the rungs. Musket balls came down, and then he heard his own guns firing, the lieutenant calling the orders, and he was climbing. The great irregular granite blocks were going past his face, and he scrambled up, the fear a living thing beside him, and he concentrated on keeping the sabre between his teeth. His jaw ached. It was such a stupid thing to worry about, because he was nearing the top, and he wanted to laugh, and he was afraid, so afraid, because the enemy would be waiting, and he felt his knuckles graze against the granite as the slope of the ladder took him close to the wall. He took the sabre from his mouth. Stop firing! The lieutenant stared up and held his breath. Knowles had to use his fist, wrapped round the sabre handle, as a prop to help him up the last rungs. It was easier than climbing with the blade in his teeth. He suddenly felt foolish, as if someone might have laughed at him for climbing a ladder with a sabre in his mouth, and he wondered why the mind chose such irrelevant and stupid thoughts at such a moment. He could hear the guns, the screams, the crash of another ladder, and the man behind pushed at him, and the top was there. This was the moment of death, and his fear harrowed him. But he pushed over the top and saw the bayonet come soaring towards him. He leant to one side, tottering on the ladder, and swung his right arm for balance, and to his surprise saw the sabre at the end of the arm cleave down into the enemy's head. A hand pushed him from behind. His feet were still pedalling at the rungs, but he'd run out of ladder. He was falling forward onto the body of the dead man, and another enemy was coming, so he rolled and twisted and knew he was there. He was on the ramparts. There was a keening in his throat that he didn't hear, a sound of insensate fear, and he thrust up with the sabre into the man's groin, and the scream winged into the night, and the blood pulsed onto Knowles's wrist, and the second man was with him. They'd done it. They had done it. The men were coming up the ladder, and he was filled with a joy that he didn't know existed. He was on his feet, his blade bloodied to the hilt, and the enemy was running towards them, muskets outstretched, but the fear was conquered. There was something odd about the Frenchmen's uniforms. They weren't blue and white. Knowles had a glimpse of red turnbacks and yellow facings, but then he was jumping forward, remembering that Sharp always attacked, and the sabre twisted a bayonet aside, flicked up, and he had the man in the throat. Like company! To me! Like company! A musket volley shattered along the parapet, but he was still alive, and more of his men were joining him. He heard the enemy shouting orders. German! These were Germans! If they were half as good as the more numerous Germans who fought for Wellington, but he would not feel fear, only victory. He led his men down the wall, bayonets out. The enemy were few and outnumbered, and every yard of wall that Knowles's men cleared was another yard where ladders could safely be climbed, and the castle parapet filled with the red uniforms. The Germans died hard. They defended each casement, each stairway, but they stood no chance. The castle had been denuded of troops. Only a thin battalion left, but that battalion fought grimly. Each minute that they saved on the battlements was another minute for the central reserves to reach the castle. So they fought on, despising the odds, and screamed as they fell from the parapets, chopped down by the redcoats, and fought till the wall was lost. Knowles felt the joy of it. They had won the unbelievable victory. They had climbed a rock hill and a castle, and they had won. He pounded his men on their backs hugged them, laughed with them, forgave them all their crimes, because they had done it. It didn't matter that the vast castle buildings would still have to be cleared, the dark, treacherous courtyards, because no one now could take this battlement from them. The British had won the city's highest point, and from here they could fight downhill into the streets, down to the main breach, and Knowles knew he would reach Teresa first, and he would see sometime in the night the gratitude on Sharp's face. He had done it. They had done it. And for the first time that night, it was British cheers that startled the air in Badajoz. The cheers could not be heard at the breaches. The castle was a long journey away, at least a mile's ride by the time a horseman had circled the floodwaters, and it would be minutes yet before the messenger would be dispatched. Picton waited. He'd heard the bell strike eleven as he saw his first magnificent men cross the parapet, and he waited, listening to the sounds of battle to know if they'd won or were being chopped to pieces in the castle yards. He heard the cheers, stood up in his stirrups and roared his own, then turned to an aide-de-camp. Ride, man, ride! He turned to another staff officer and clapped the man mightily on the back. We proved him wrong. Damn his eyes, we did it! He chuckled. 
anticipating Wellington's reaction when the news arrived at midnight. Anger would take a man through a breach, sheer passion, but a small idea helped. It wasn't much of an idea, hopeless even, deserving the name forlorn, but it was all Sharp had, and so he stared at the ravelin that stretched so invitingly towards the third unsullied breach. There was no point in trying to outrace the grape shot across its flat diamond surface. Any man who tried was flicked hopelessly away, contemptuous meat to the gunner's fire. Yet the third breach was the newest, and the French had been given small time to entrap it, and Sharp could see through the sifting smoke that the chevaux de frise on the new breach's summit was too short. There was a gap at the right-hand side, a gap three men could pass abreast, and the only problem was reaching the gap. There was no approach in the ditch, the fire still seethed white hot and violent, and the only path was across the ravelin. They must climb the ravelin, brave the top, and jump into the ditch, and it must be done at the ravelin's edge, close to the flames, where the diamond shape narrowed and the fatal journey was short. He had no right to take the company on the journey. This was a forlorn hope, born of despair and nurtured by pride, and it belonged to the volunteer, to the foolish. He knew he didn't have to go himself, but he wanted no dead man's shoes. He'd waited, letting the violence of the last attack spend itself in the ditch, and there was now a kind of truce before the breaches. As long as the British stayed quiet, harmless behind the ravelin, the gunners let them be. Only when men came into the firelight, towards the breaches, did the muzzles spout flame and the grape shot crease the ditch floor. Back in the darkness, down the glasses, Sharp could hear orders being called. Another attack was coming, the last reserves of the division being fed into the ditch, and that was the moment, the hopeless moment, when the feeble idea, based only on the narrowing width of the ravelin, must be tried. He turned to his men and drew the sword, the blade a great streak in the night, and the steel hissed as he swung it to the point of the firelight. I'm going there. There's one more attack, just one, and then it's all over. No one's touched that central breach, and that's where I'm going. Over the ravelin, down into the ditch, and I'll probably break my bloody legs because there are no ladders or hay bags, and that's where I'm going. The faces were pale, staring at him as they squatted on the slope. I'm going because the French are laughing at us, because they think they've beaten us, and I'm going to hammer those bastards into pulp for thinking that. He hadn't known how much anger there was inside him. He wasn't a speechmaker, never had been, but the anger gave him words. I'm going to make those bastards wish they'd never been born. They're going to die, and I can't ask you to come with me, because you don't have to come, but I'm going, and you can stay here, and I won't blame you. He stopped, out of words, unsure even of what he'd said. The fires crackled behind him. Patrick Harper stood up, stretched his huge arms, and in one of them, catching the fires of death, was a vast axe, one of the many that had been issued to cut at the obstacles in the ditch. He stepped forward over the dead and turned to look at the company. In the flamelight, hard by the terrible ditch, Patrick Harper was like a warrior sprung from a forgotten age. He grinned at the company. Are you coming? There was nothing to make them go. Too often Sharp had asked the impossible of them, and they'd always given, but never in this horror, never like this. But they stood up, the pimps and the thieves, murderers and drunks, and they grinned at Sharp and looked to their weapons. Harper looked down on his captain. That was a fine speech, sir, but mine was better. Would you be giving me that? He pointed to the seven-barrel gun. Sharp nodded, handed it over. It's loaded. Daniel Hagman, the poacher, took Sharp's rifle. No man was a better shot. Lieutenant Price, nervously flexing his sabre, grinned at Sharp. I think I'm mad, sir. Well, you can stay. Well, let you get to the women first. Well, I'll come. Roach and Peters, Jenkins and Clayton, Cressica and the wife Peter, all were there, and all felt the nervous exhilaration. This was a place fit to go mad in. Sharp looked at them, counted them, loved them. Where's Hakeswill? Bug it off, sir. Haven't seen him. Peters, a huge man, spat on the glasses. Below them, the last battalion was climbing the slope, almost within the firelight, and Sharp knew that the company must attack at the same time. Ready? Sir. A mile's ride away, unknown to the rest of the army, the 3rd Division was clearing the last of the castle yards. It had taken nearly an hour's hard fighting against the Germans, 
and against the French who had pounded up from the central reserve in the cathedral square. A mile in the other direction, equally unknown, Leith's 5th Division had stormed the San Vincente. The lattice had split apart, the wood green, and the men had fallen into a spiked ditch. But other ladders were brought up, the muskets smashed at the battlements, and they had won a second impossible victory. Badajoz had fallen. The 5th Division were in the city streets. The 3rd possessed the castle. But the men in the ditch and in the dark glasses had no way of knowing. The news travelled faster inside the city. Rumours of defeat raced like a plague through the narrow streets, up onto the Santa Maria and Trinidad bastions, and the defenders looked fearfully behind them. The city was dark, the castle's silhouette unchanged, and they shrugged and told each other it couldn't be true. But what if it was? Fear battered at them with grim wings. Make ready! By God, another attack! The defenders turned from the city and looked over the walls. There from the darkness, from the corpse-littered slope, another attack surged towards the ditch. More meat for the guns, and the fire flashed down the priming tubes, the smoke crashed out, and the mincer turned on. Sharp waited for the first gun, heard it, and started running to Badajoz. Chapter 27 The heights of the wall disappeared in smoke, the flames lancing through, and he jumped the sword high, and the men in the ditch screamed at them, Down! Down! He hadn't counted on this. The ditch was crammed with the living, the dying, and the dead, and the living clawed at him. Get down! They'll kill us! He'd sprawled down on bodies, but he scrambled up and heard his men thumping around him. There were small fortresses in the ditch, piled corpses that soaked the grapeshot and sheltered men who themselves crouched on other corpses. The bullets flickered into the ravelin's shadow, and the wounded pulled at him, and Sharp swung the sword ahead of him, clearing a path. He screamed at them, Out the way! The dead could not move, and he was wading in bodies, slipping on blood, and to his right, by the Trinidad, the gunners were shredding the last attack. Hands clutched at Sharp, tried to pull him down, and out of the darkness a bayonet was thrown at him. Behind him, Harper was shouting, in his own tongue, rousing the Irish. A man reared up in front of Sharp, clawed at him, and Sharp hammered down with the sword hilt. Ahead was the ravelin's sloping face with the light bright above it, and the guns were waiting. Sharp felt the temptation to sink into the rank stench in the ditch and let the night hide him. He swung the sword again using the flat, and a man fell and Sharp's feet were on the slope, and he climbed, not wanting to, fearing the oblivion, his body cringing from the death that ravaged the ravelin's top. He stopped. There was a new sound in the ditch, a sound so mad that he'd turned, the sword bright in his hand, and he looked unbelievingly behind him. The survivors of the South Essex, their yellow facings smeared with blood, were struggling towards him. They'd seen their like company carve a path to the ravelin, and now they wanted to join the madness— but it was their voices that had stopped Sharp. Sharp! 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 They chanted it senselessly, a war cry, and men who didn't know what it meant picked up the sound, and the ditch stirred, and the Sharp bellied into the night. Sharp! 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 What are they saying, March? Well, it sounds like Sharp, my lord. The general laughed, because moments before he'd wished for one thousand Sharps, and now, perhaps... That rogue was giving him the city. His aide-de-camp, hearing the grim tone of the laughter, didn't understand and did not like to ask. The gunners high on the wall heard the chant and didn't understand. They were massacring the newest attack on the Trinidad, hurling it back as they had hurled the others back. But then they saw the ravelin's top, dark with men, and the men were shouting, and the whole ditch was moving that they had thought filled with corpses, and the corpses had come to life and were coming to them for their revenge— and the dead were shouting, Sharp, Sharp, Sharp! The madness was on Sharp, the glory of it, the song of battle shrieking in his ears, so he didn't hear the gunfire, or feel the blast of the shot, or know that behind him, crossing the diamond, the men were falling, and the guns were tangling the air with death. He jumped. He crossed the ravelin, running, the heat of the fire close on his right side, and the drop was huge. The new ditch was strangely empty, and he jumped, seeing a stone leap from a musket strike. The jump winded him, pitched him forward, but he was up and running. Sharp! 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 I will die here, he thought, in this empty ditch with the strange white bundles that stirred in the small breeze. 
He remembered the wall padding that had protected the two breaches and wondered at a mind that could notice such irrelevant things at the point of death. Sharp! 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 I will die here, he thought, just at the foot of the slope. And then he hated the bastards who would kill him, and the anger drove him up, slipping on the rubble, unable to fight, only to climb, to carry the sword to the French flesh. There were men around him screaming unintelligibly, and the air was thick with smoke, grapeshot, and flame. Harper was passing him, the huge axe held easily, and Sharp, refusing to be second, drove his legs towards the dark sky beyond the row of shining blades. Sharp! 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 Private Cressica was dying, his gut strung blue on his lap, his tears for himself and for his wife, who he would suddenly miss, though he had beat her cruelly. And Sergeant Reed, the Methodist, the quiet man who never swore or drank, was blind, and couldn't cry because the guns had taken his eyes. And past them, mad with lust, a battle madness, went the dark horde who followed Sharp and tore their hands on the rough stone going up the slope, up where they'd never dreamt to go. And some went back, torn by the guns, piling the new ditch as the other was piled. But the fine madness was on them. Sharp! 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 You save your breath for climbing, but shouting dulls the fear, and who needs breath when death waits at the summit? A bullet clanged on Sharp's sword, jerking it in his hand, but it was whole, and the blades were near. He went to the right, his whole brain singing with the scream of death, and a stone moved beneath his left hand, throwing him, and a huge hand pushed at him, heaved him, and Sharp grabbed at the thick chain that anchored the chevaux de frise, the top, death's peak. Sharp! 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 The French fired once more, the guns slamming backwards, and the new breach was taken. Two vast men standing at its crest, untouched by fire, and the French ran with nowhere to run, and Harper screamed at the sky because he'd done a great thing. Sharp leapt downhill into the city, and the sword was a live thing in his hand. A breach was taken, death cheated, and death wanted a payment. The sword chopped down on the blue uniforms, and he didn't see men, just enemy, and he ran, slipping, falling down the breach until the ground was firm beneath him, and he was inside. Inside Barachov. And he snarled at the bastards, killed them, found a gun crew carring by a wall, and remembered the song of death, the leaping flames. The sword hacked at them, cut them, chopped them, and an axe was whirled at them. And the French abandoned the new low wall behind the breaches, because the night was lost. A dark tide flowed over the breach, over the other breaches, a tide that made now no coherent sound. It was terrifying in its incoherence, the sound of the banshee, the keening of too much sorrow, too much death, and the madness turned to insensate rage, and they killed. They killed till their arms were tired, till they were soaked with blood, and there weren't enough men to kill, and they turned into the streets a scrabbling dark flood up into Barachov. Harper leapt the wall built behind the breaches. A man cowered there pleading, but the axe dropped and Harper's lips were drawn back around his teeth, and he was sobbing in anger at the city. There were more men ahead, blue uniformed, and he ran at them, the axe circling, and Sharp was there, and they killed because so many were dead, so much blood. An army had nearly died, and these were the bastards who had jeered at it. Blood and more blood, an account to be balanced with a ditch full of blood. Barachov. Sharp was crying, venting an anger that had waited for this moment. He stood, the sword dark red, and he wanted more Frenchmen to come to his sword, and he stalked them, teeth bared, screaming at the night. And a body moved, a blue arm lifted, and the blade whirled, bit, was lifted again, and bit down once more, clean to the pavement. A Frenchman, a mathematician conscripted as an artillery officer, who had counted forty separate attacks on the Trinidad, and had repulsed them all, stood quiet in the shadows. He was still, quite still, waiting for this madness to pass, this bloodlust, and he thought of his fiancée far away, and prayed she would never see anything as horrid. He watched the rifle officer and prayed for himself that he wouldn't be seen, but the face turned, the eyes hard bright with tears, and the mathematician called out, No, monsieur, no! The sword took him, disemboweled him, as Cressica had been disemboweled, and Sharp sobbed in rage as he ripped again and again, thrusting down at the gunner, ripping and mutilating the bastard, and then the giant hands gripped him. Sir! Harper shook him. Sir! Christ! Sir! 
The hands pulled on sharp shoulders, turning him. Christ! Sir! Harper slapped him. Sir! Sharp leant back against the wall, his head back touching the stone. Oh, Jesus! Oh, God! He was panting, the sword arm limp, and the pavement ahead was shredded with blood. He looked down at the artillery officer torn into a grotesque death. Oh, God! He was surrendering! It doesn't matter! Harper had recovered first, the axe shattered in a killing strike, and he had watched in awe as Sharp had killed. Now he quieted Sharp, soothed him, and watched the sense come back even as the madness climbed up the city streets. Sharp looked up, calm now, his voice bereft of all feeling. We did it. Yes. Sharp leant his head back again onto the wall, and his eyes closed. It was done, the breach. And to do it, he had discovered that a man must banish fear as never before. And with that fear must go all other emotion except rage and anger. Humanity must go. Feeling. All must go, except rage. Only that would conquer the unconquerable. Sir? Harper plucked at Sharp's elbow. No one else could have done this, Harper thought. No one but Sharp could have led men past Death's Peak. Sir! The eyes opened. The face came down, and Sharp stared at the bodies. He'd slaked his pride, carried it through a breach, and it was done. He looked at Patrick Harper. I wish I could play the flute. Sir? Patrick? Teresa, sir! Teresa! God in heaven! Teresa! Chapter 28 Hexwell hadn't meant to go into the ditch, but as soon as the South Essex made their attack and had left the light company to give covering fire from the glasses slip, he had seen that there was greater safety for him in the shadow of the ravelin. No chance there of an axe blow in the dark from Harper, and so he'd swung himself down a ladder, snarling at the frightened men, and then, in the chaos, had burrowed deep into the bodies in the shadowed ditch. He saw the attack go in, saw it fail, and he watched as Wyndham and Forrest tried to rouse other attacks, but Sergeant Hexwell was snug and safe. Three bodies covered him, still warm in death, and he felt them shudder from time to time as the great fragments struck home, but he was safe. At some time in the night, a lieutenant, a stranger to Hexwell, tried to provoke him from his lair, screaming at the sergeant to move and attack, but it was simple to grip the lieutenant's ankle, trip him, and the bayonet slid so easily between the ribs, and Hexwell had a fourth body, surprise on its face, and he cackled as he slid expert hands over the pockets and pouches and counted his loot. Four gold coins, a silver locket, and, best of all, an inlaid pistol that Hexwell tugged from the lieutenant's belt. The weapon was loaded, balanced to perfection, and he grinned as he thrust it into his jacket. Every little helped. He had tied his shako with strings beneath his chin. He fumbled at the knot, tore it apart, and held the hat close before his face. We're safe now. Safe. His voice was ingratiating, plaintive. I promise you, I would I won't let you down. Near to him, just beyond his parapet of corpses, a man sobbed and screamed and called for his mother. He was a long time dying. Hegswell listened, his head cocked like an animal, and then he looked again into the hat. He wants his mother, he does. Tears came to his eyes. His mother. He looked up into the darkness over the flames, and he howled at the sky. There were periods of quietness in the ditch, periods when the death did not plunge downwards, and when the mass of men, living and dead, crouched motionless beneath the high muzzles. And then, just when it seemed that the fight might be over, there'd be a stir in the ditch. Men would try to rush the breaches, be restrained by other men, and the guns would fire again, and the screaming would start again. Some men went mad, the agony too much, and one man thought the guns were the sound of God hawking and spitting, and he knelt in the ditch and prayed until a lump of God's spittle took off his head, but Hegswell was safe. He sat with his back to the ditch scarp, his front protected by the dead, and he talked into his hat. Not tonight. I can't do it tonight. 
Well, the pretty lady will have to wait. Oh, yes, she will. He wheedled into the hat and then listened to the fight with a professional's ear. He shook his head. Not tonight. Tonight we lose. He didn't know how long he was in the ditch, or how long it took the dying to die, or how many times the lifeless flesh quivered around him as the canister pulverized the pile. Time was measured by sobs, by guns, by the passing of hopes, and it ended unexpectedly with the great shout, Sharp! 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 Eggsville's face twitched over his parapet and watched as the living climbed from the spaces between the bodies, and they were going away from him, over the ravelin, and to his right another attack clawed up the Trinidad. Sharp! 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 The two men, he thought, must die, and he cackled at them, willing the canister to shred them. But they kept climbing, and the shout went on. Sharp! 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 Hakeswell saw Sharp slip, almost to the top of the ramp, and the sergeant's heart leapt for joy. He was shot. But no, the bastard was pushed on by Harper, reached up for a chain, and there he stood, high on the central breach, lit by flames. And the Irishman was beside him, blades in their hands. And Hakeswell watched as they turned once to gesture a great triumph towards the British. Then they'd gone, down to the city, and Hakeswell pushed the bodies aside, rammed his shake on his head, and kicked his way through the crowd that was flooding towards the Trinidad. At the breach's head, men swung the great axes. The chains split, and the chevaux de frise was heaved ahead of them and into a trench the defenders had dug on the rubble crest. And then the British were jumping the blades, shrieking murder, and sliding down the broken stones to the city's interior. They were berserk with rage. Hakesbury could feel it, the madness, and nothing would stop them this night. Even the wounded were pulling themselves up the breach ramps, some on their bellies trying to reach the city, and asking only for a chance to hurt as they had been hurt. They wanted drink, and women, and deaths, and more drink, and they remembered that Spaniards had fired at them from the city's walls, and that made every living person in Barajod an enemy. So they went a dark, scrabbling stream over the breaches and up into the alleyways and streets, trampling the wounded in their rush. More coming, more, the breaches living with the mass of men scuttling into the city, spreading up into Barajod, revenge. Hegswell went with them up a long street that led to a small plaza. He knew he was going in roughly the right direction, uphill and angling left, but he was trusting to instinct and luck. The plaza was already crowded with soldiers, Muskets sounded as door locks were blasted open. The first screams were coming from the city's women, and some, not wanting to be trapped in their houses, tried to run higher up the hill. Hexwell watched one court. Her earrings were ripped from her, and blood sprayed on her dress as that too was torn from her, and she was naked, spitting between the soldiers who pushed her, laughed at her, and then leapt on her. Hexwell skirted the group. It wasn't his business, and he guessed that the woman who had escaped would lead him to the cathedral. He followed. Captain Robert Knowles, elated and tired, leant briefly on the castle gateway. Hooves echoed in the streets. Philippon, the French general, with a handful of mounted men, had ridden away, escaping down to the bridge that would take them to refuge in the San Cristobal fort. They had lost the huge fortress, and as they rode, they heard the dark business begin behind them. They whipped the horses, raked back with spurs, clattered onto the bridge, and behind them running came the fleeing French infantry. Philippon's face was grief-stricken, not for the city, but for his failure. He had done all that could be done, far more than he'd hoped, yet still he had lost. Wellington, damned Wellington, had won. Knowles's men crowded into the gateway, jeering the departing enemy, and one of them seized a torch from its bracket. Permission to go, sir? The flames lit the eager, hungry faces that watched Knowles. Go! They cheered, ran whooping into the streets, and Knowles laughed for them, hefted his sabre, and followed. Teresa. He ran into the dark streets, the doors bolted, the ground floor windows covered in intricate iron bars, and he was soon lost, alone in a tangle of streets. He stopped at a crossroads, listening to the screams up and down the hill, and then guessed that he should follow the street with the richest houses. A man pounded past him uphill, and he saw the distinctive crossbelt of a French soldier. 
The man was armed, his long bayonet gleaming, but he didn't stop, just kept running, his breath coming in rasping heaves. Knowles ran downhill, his boots echoing from the dark houses. And then the street stopped, opened into a big plaza, and there above him was the cathedral. There was panic in the plaza. The last French had gone, escaping north, but the people of Barajov had not gone with them. Those that were not in their houses were here, struggling up the cathedral steps, crowding its doors, hoping for sanctuary. They ran past Knowles, barging into him, ignoring him, and he looked wildly around him. There were so many streets. And then he saw, dark behind the cathedral, a small alley with balconied houses, and he ran, staring up at the buildings. And then he stopped, turned, and he saw two trees, a recessed frontage, and he pounded on the closed door. Teresa! Teresa! Hakeswill had taken the right-hand street that led up from the small plaza, and, sure enough, the woman had run ahead of him to the cathedral. He slowed to a walk, chuckling to himself, and then he heard the shouts very close, and his first instinct was that Sharp had reached the house first. Teresa! Teresa! That was not Sharp's voice. An officer by the sound of it, but not Sharp. And Hexwell flattened himself against the opposite wall and watched the dark shape pounding at the door. Teresa, it's me, Robert Knowles! A shutter opened on the first floor, seeping dim candlelight, and Hexwell saw a woman's shape, slim and long-haired. It must be her. He felt the excitement inside him, shifting restlessly, uncoiling. And then she called down. Who's that? Robert! Robert Knowles! Robert? Yes! Open up! Oh, where's Richard? I don't know. I wasn't with him. Knowles was standing back, staring up at the narrow balcony. The screams were coming nearer, the musket shots, and Teresa looked down the hill at the first flickerings of burning houses. Wait! I open up. She banged the shutters close, latched them, and opposite, in deep shadow, Hexwell grinned to himself. He could rush the door as she opened it, but the officer, he could see, was carrying a drawn saber, and he remembered that the bitch herself carried weapons. He looked up to the balcony. It wasn't high, and beneath it the ground floor window was barred with a lattice of black iron. He waited. The front door opened, creaking on hinges, and he saw the girl silhouetted in the gap for the brief instant it took for Knowles to enter. The door shut, and Hexwell moved, surprisingly fast and soft for such a man, straight to the barred window that gave such easy footholds, up till he could reach back to the balcony's base. And then the strength was all in his arms. He paused briefly, his face suddenly twitching, but then the spasm passed, and he pulled, the powerful arms making it easy, hand over hand till his feet caught on the balcony, and he climbed over the rail. The shutter was wooden, gapped for the night air, and he could see the empty room. He pushed at the shutter. It was locked. But he pushed again, increasing the pressure, and the wood creaked, bent, and then splintered inwards. He froze, but the noise of the city's sack was covering his own noise, and he moved again into the room, and the bayonet whispered from the scabbard. A cry. He turned, and there in a wooden cot was a baby. Sharp's bastard. He cackled to himself, crossed the room, and stared down. The child had cried in its sleep. He took off his hat and held the hat over the baby and talked to the hat. And you see, there it is, like I was once. Is that right, mother? Like me? The child moved and Hexwell crooned. Sleepy Baba, sleepy Baba. You remember saying that, mother, to your Obadiah? A footstep on the stairs... Another, the creak of wood and voices outside. He could hear the girl and the officer, and he dropped the hat onto the baby and pulled the pistol from within his jacket. He was still listening to her voice, the bayonet in his left hand, pistol in his right, and the baby cried again in her sleep, and Teresa opened the door and spoke to it in gentle Spanish, and stopped. Hello, Missy. The face twitched yellow in the candlelight, the mouth grinning, black teeth showing on rotten gums, and the raw scar on the ungainly neck, twitching with the head. Exwell laughed. <laughs> Hello. Remember me? 
Teresa looked at her child, and the bayonet was just above Antonia's cot, and she gasped. Knowles pushed her aside, brought up the sabre, and the pistol flared, waking the child, and the bullet threw Knowles backward, backward through the door to fall with Hegswell's cackle, the last sound in his life. Hegswell kept the bayonet above the baby and pushed the pistol still smoking back into his jacket. The blue eyes turned to Teresa, her own gaze fixed on the bayonet, and he grinned at her. Didn't need him, Missy, did we? Only takes two to do what we're going to do. He cackled, a mad sound, but his eyes were level and his bayonet steady. Shut the door, Missy. She swore at him and he laughed. She was more beautiful than he remembered, the dark hair framing the fine face, and he bent down and put his right hand beneath the baby. It was crying. She moved towards it, but the bayonet flickered, and she stopped. Axwell picked the child up, bedclothes bundled, and he held it awkwardly in his right arm, and his left was held out and bent back so that the needle-pointed bayonet was at the tiny soft throat. I said, shut the door. His voice was low, very low, and he saw the fear on her face, and his desire was heavy, so heavy. She shut the door, slamming it on Noel's dead feet, and Hegswell nodded at it. Bolt it. The bolt slammed home. The hat was still in the cot, and Hegswell regretted it, because he would like his mother, whose likeness was in the crown, to see this. But it couldn't be helped. He walked slowly towards Teresa, who backed away, back towards the bed where her rifle was laid, and he grinned at her, twitched, and the triumph was in his voice. Just you and me, Missy. Just you and Obadiah. Chapter 29 Which way? God knows! Sharp searched frantically for a main street. The central breach faced a tangle of alleys. He chose an opening at random and started running. This way! There were screams ahead, shots and bodies lying in the alleyway. It was too dark to tell if the corpses were French or Spanish. The alley stank of blood, death, and the night soil thrown earlier from the upper windows, and the two men slipped in their haste. Light came from a cross alley, and Sharp turned instinctively, still running with a huge bloodied sword held like a lance. A door opened ahead and spilt men into the alley, blocking it, and after them came wine barrels, huge tons, that they hammered with their musket butts until the staves burst and the wine cascaded onto the cobbles. The men dropped, put mouths to the gushing liquid, scooped at it, and Sharp and Harper kicked them aside, pushed past and came out into the small plaza. One house burned, throwing the light that had attracted them, and in the blaze they could see a medieval depiction of hell. The people of Barachod suffered the torments of red-jacketed devils. A naked woman wandered, sobbing and bloodied in the plaza's centre. She was too hurt to feel any more, too abused to care, and when new men, fresh from the breach, grabbed her and threw her down, she made no protest, but sobbed on, and all around it was the same. Some women struggled, some had died, others had watched their children die, and around them the victors capered, half-dressed, half-drunk, lit by the fire and festooned with their loot. Some of the devils fought, squabbling over women or wine, and Sharp saw two Portuguese soldiers bayonet a British sergeant, seize the woman beneath him and drag her into a house. A child screaming hysterically toddled after, but the door was slammed and the child left. Harper's face showed a terrible fury. He kicked the door, bursting it open, and plunged into the house. A shop was fired, splintering the lintel, and then the Portuguese came out one after the other, thrown with a bone-crunching force, and the Irishman picked up the child, handed it in and shut the door as best he could. He shrugged at Sharp. Others'll get her. Which way? Two roads led uphill, the larger to the left, and Sharp took it, pushing through the riot, the scenes from hell. Once, inexplicably, the pavement seemed to be running with silver coins that no one touched. One by one the doors were shot open, the houses ripped apart, a whole city at an army's mercy, and the army had little. A few men showed decency, protecting a woman or a family, but the decent men were too often shot down. Officers who tried to stop the carnage were shot. Discipline was dead. The mob ruled Barachov. Screams deafened the two men. 
and they were thrown back onto a wall by a horde of women, stark naked, whose slobbering and spitting had erupted from an unbarred door. A nun screamed at them from the doorway, but more women came from inside, and Sharp knew a madhouse was emptying itself into the streets. There was no point in locking up the mad in Badajoz this night, and there were whoops from behind and cheers as the soldiers charged up and into the lunatics. One pulled at the nun, while another leapt onto a huge naked woman's back, gripped her wild grey hair as reins, and all the soldiers tried to ride a lunatic. There, sir! Harper pointed. Above them and ahead was the cathedral tower, its square crenellated outline obvious in the sky, and from its arched openings the bells jangled a cacophony, because drunken men were dangling on the ropes, signalling a victory. They stopped at the street's end in front of the cathedral, and to their left was a great plaza, the rape beneath its trees lit by a huge fire, and to their right a dark alley. Sharp started towards it, but his arm was pulled, and he turned to see a girl, short and weeping, clinging to his sleeve. She had been roused from a house, chased, and her pursuers came after as she held on to the tall man whose face had looked untouched by the madness. Senor! Senor! Her tormentors in the white facings of the 43rd reached for the girl, and Sharp swept the sword at them, cutting one man's arm, and he watched their bayonets drop for the attack, and the girl was hampering him. He swung again, being forced back by British bayonets, but then Harper came between him and his attackers. The seven-barrel gun whirled as a club, and they went back. This way! Sharp shouted, and with the girl still clinging to him, he pushed into the alley. Harper came behind, threatening the men of the 43rd with the giant gun until they gave up and went for easier spoils. And then the sergeant turned after Sharp to find the alley was a dead end. Sharp swore. Harper seized the girl who shrank away, but his touch was gentle and his voice urgent. Donde esta la casa Moreno? It was the limit of his Spanish, and the girl shook her head. He tried again, letting his voice reassure her. Listen, miss, casa Moreno. Comprendo? Donde esta la casa Moreno? She spoke in fast, excited Spanish and pointed to the cathedral. Sharp swore again in exasperation. She doesn't know. We'll, we'll go back. He started forward, but Harper put out a hand. No, look! There were steps leading to a side door, and the Irishman pushed Sharp towards it. She means through the cathedral. It's a short cut. The girl stumbled on her dress, but Harper caught her, and she clung to his hand as he pushed open the huge studded door. Sharp heard the Irishman draw in a breath. The cathedral had been a refuge, a sanctuary, but no longer. Troops had invaded it, had chased the women, caught them, and now under the myriad votive candles the women were being raped. A nun, her habit ripped apart, was spread-eagled on the high altar, while an Irishman of the 88th, down from the castle of Salt, tried vainly to climb up to her. He was far too drunk. The girl gasped, began to scream, but Harper held her firm. Casar Moreno, see? She nodded, too appalled to speak, and led them across the great floor of the transept, between the altar and the transcoro, and round the huge chandelier that had been cut from its moorings and had crashed down onto the flagstones, crushing a corporal from the seventh who still twitched under its weight. Dead lay on the floor while the wounded, sobbing in their misery, crawled towards the obscuring shadows of the nave. Be with us now and in the hour of our need. A priest, who had tried to stop the soldiers, lay by the north door, and Sharp and Harper stepped over the body into the great plaza, and the girl pointed again to her right, and they ran until she pulled Harper right again into a dark alleyway seething with troops who beat at shut doors, and in their frustration fired shots at upper barred windows. Harper protected the girl, held her close, as they pushed through the men. Sharp sawed their passport, and then the girl shouted at them, pointed, and Sharp saw the dark shapes of two trees, and knew he had arrived. There were cheers from the doorway, a creaking, a great crash, and a mass of men in front of them melted away as they streamed into Moreno's courtyard. Barrels waited for them, thick barrels, full barrels, and the men fell on the wine, forgetting everything else, and in his counting-house, praying next to his wife who had returned home at midnight, Rafael Moreno prayed and hoped he'd provided enough wine for the soldiers and thick enough bolts for his counting-house door. Hexwell cursed. 
He heard the commotion below, the crashing of the great doors, and he spat at Teresa. Hurry! A bullet splintered the shutter and buried itself in the ceiling, and he turned, fearing sharp, but it was only a stray shot from the street. The baby was awkward in his arm, but it was his best threat, and he didn't want to kill it yet. The bayonet was still at Antonia's throat, her crying reduced to heaving breathless sobs, and Hexwell twitched the blade, ground his teeth as the twitching caught him, and bellowed again. Hurry! She was still dressed, damn her, and he wanted this business done. Two shoes off, that was all, and he twitched the bayonet again, drawing a trickle of blood, and he saw her arms go up to the fastening of her dress. That's right, missy. They want baby to die, do he? He cackled, and the cackling became a racking cough, and Teresa watched the blade at her child's throat. She dared not attack him, dared not, and then the coughing stopped and the eyes opened again. Get on with it, missy. We've got time to make up, remember? Teresa slowly undid the knot at her throat, pretending to fumble with the material, and she saw the excitement in his face, and then he began to swallow rapidly, so that his Adam's apple pulled at the scar's tip. Hurry, missy. Hurry. Hegswell could feel the excitement. She had humiliated him, this bitch, and now it was her turn. She would die, and so would her bastard, but he would have his enjoyment first. And he began to work out in his head the problem of holding the baby while he took her. And then he knew she was taking her time. I'll slit its throat, missy, then yours. But if you want this little bastard to live, you'd better take them clothes off and fast. The door bulged under Harper's foot, the crash spinning Hegswell round, and then the bolt sheared. The door shook on its hinges, and Hegswell held the bayonet vertically above Antonia's throat. Stop! Teresa had reached for the rifle. She froze. Harper was through the door, and his momentum drove him onto the cot, and then he, too, was utterly motionless as he sprawled on all fours and stared at the seventeen-inch bayonet. Sharp, the girl behind him, stopped in the doorway, and his sword, which had been reaching towards Hegswell, was suspended in mid-lunge, so that its blood-thickened tip quivered in the room's center. Hegswell laughed. Bit lace, aren't you, Sharpie? <laughs> they called you that, didn't they, Sharpie? Or, or Dick? Lucky Sharp, I remember. <laughs> Clever little Sharpie. But it didn't stop you being flogged, did it? Sharp looked to Harper, Teresa, and then back to Hegswell. He gestured slowly at Noel's body. Did you do this? Hegswell cackled and his shoulders heaved. Oh, clever little bastard, aren't you, Sharpie? Of course I bloody did it. The little bastard came to protect your lady. He sneered at Teresa. My lady now. Her dress was open at the neck, and Hegswell could see a slim gold cross against her brown skin. He wanted her. He wanted that skin beneath his hands, and he would have her. And kill her. And Sharp could watch, because none of them would dare touch him while he still threatened the baby. The girl behind Sharp moaned, and Hegswell's head twitched towards the door. Oh, you got a whore there, Sharpie. Well, you have. Well, bring her in. The girl stepped over Knowles's body and into the room. She moved slowly, terrified of the yellow-skinned, belly-paunched man who held the heaving, sob-racked baby. She went to stand by Harper, her foot kicking Hegswell's shako that had fallen from the upset cot. The hat rolled to a stop, upended by Harper's hand. Hegswell watched her. Very nice. Pretty little missy. He cackled. Well, you like the Irishman, the dearie. She was shaking at the sight of him, and Hegswell laughed. He's a pig. They all are. The bloody Irish, dirty, great pigs. You're better off with me, missy. The blue eyes went back to Sharp. Shut the door, Sharpie. Gentle now. Sharp shut the door, careful not to alarm the twitching man who held his baby. He could not see Antonia's face, just the great, sore-backed bayonet that was above the bundle of bedclothes. Hexwell laughed at him. Very good. You can watch now, Sharpie. He looked at Harper, frozen grotesquely where he'd tripped. And you, pig, you can watch. Stand up. Hexwell wasn't sure how he would do this, but he'd work something out because he knew that as long as the child was in his power, then all these people were in it too. He liked the new girl, Harper's girl by the look of it, and he could take her with him, out into the city, but he would have to kill Sharp and Harper first, 
because they knew he'd killed Knowles. He shook his head. He'd kill them because he hated them. He laughed, then saw that Harper had not moved. I told you to stand up, you Irish bastard. Stand. Harper stood up, his heart beating at the risk, and in his hands he held the shako. He'd seen the picture in the crown, and he had no real idea who it was, but he stood up, one hand holding the hat, the other reaching inside it. He saw Hegswell's face show alarm. The bare neck quivered. Give it to me. The voice had become whining. Give it to me. Pit the baby down. No one else moved. Teresa didn't understand, nor did Sharp, and Harper had only the vaguest idea. A hunch. A straw that was the only thing to clutch in this whirling madness. Hexwell shook, his face jerking spasmodically. Give it to me. He was sobbing. My mammy. <gasps> My mammy, give it to me. The Ulster voice was soft, growling deep from the massive chest. I have my nails on her eyes, Hickswell. Soft eyes, soft eyes, and I will claw them out, Hickswell. Claw them out, and your mommy will scream. No, no, <gasps> no. Hickswell was swaying, crying, cringing. The baby was crying with him. The yellow face looked at Harper. The voice was pleading. Don't do it. Don't do it, not to my mammy. I will, so I will, and I will unless you put the baby down. You put the baby down. He spoke in a rhythm as to a child, and Hegswell swayed with the rhythm. The head went into violent twitches, and suddenly the fear was gone, and he looked at Harper. Do you think I'm a fool? Mother's hurting. No. The madness was back instantly, and Sharp watched appalled as the great shambling man retreated into the insanity that had always seemed close. He was crouching now, knees below the baby, and rocking himself as he wept, though the bayonet was still above the child, and Sharp still dared not move. Your mother's talking to me over there. The Ulster voice turned Hexwell's head back to Harper. He was holding the hat by his ear. She wants you. To put the baby down. Put the baby down. She wants you to help her. Help her. Because she likes her eyes. Oh, they're very nice eyes over there. Mother's eyes. The sergeant was breathing in short, fast gasps, and he nodded his head. I will. I will. Give me my mother. She's coming to you, so she is, but put the baby down. 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 Harper took one gentle step towards the sergeant and held the hat out, not far enough. And Hegswell's face was the face of a child who'll do anything not to be whipped. He nodded eagerly, the tears coursing down his cheeks. I'm putting, I'm putting baby down, mother. I'm putting... Baby down. Obadiah never wanted to hurt baby. And the great blade came up from the throat. The hat was inched nearer, and then Hegswill, still crying and twitching, put the baby on the bed's coverlet and turned bullet fast to snatch at the hat. You bastard! Harper pulled the hat back and threw a huge punch. Teresa snatched the child to safety at the head of the bed and then turned the rifle in her hands, and she was clawing at the flint. Sharp lunged with the sword, but Hexwell was going back from the punch, and the blade missed. Hexwell had fallen, still without the hat, and he reached for it again. The rifle fired, the range less than a yard, but he was still going for the hat, and Harper kicked him, sending him backwards, and Sharp's second blow missed again. Stop him! Harper threw the hat behind him and grabbed at Hexwell. Teresa, not believing that she could have missed with a rifle bullet, swung the empty gun at the sergeant, and the barrel scything through the air knocked Harper's arm so that his snatch missed, and all he could touch was Hexwell's haversack. He gripped it, pulled at it, and Hexwell bellowed at them, swung his own fist, pulled away so that the haversack straps broke, and it was left in Harper's hand. Hexwell looked for the hat. It was gone, beyond Sharp and his sword, and Hexwell gave a long, low moan, 
because he'd only found his mother a few days before, and now she was gone. His mother, the only person who had loved him, who had sent her brother to rescue him from the scaffold, and now he had lost her. He moaned again, slashing with the bayonet, and then jumped for the shattered window, splintered the remains of the shutter, and threw a leg over the balcony. Three people reached for him, but he swung the bayonet, raised his other leg, and jumped. Stop! Harper's bellow was not at Hakeswill, but at Sharp and Teresa, who were blocking him. He pushed them aside, unslung the seven-barrel gun that he hadn't fired in the breach, and put it to his shoulder. Hakeswill was sprawling in the roadway, scrambling to his feet, and it was a shot Harper could not miss. He felt his lips curl into a smile. He pulled the trigger, the gun smacked into his shoulder like a mule's kick, and the window was blotted by smoke. Got the bastard! The cackle came from the road. The jeering cackle, and Harper fanned at the smoke, leant from the balcony, and there in the shadows the lumpen figure was moving away, hatless and gross, the footsteps lost in the city screaming. He was alive. Harper shook his head. He can't kill that bastard. That's what he always says. Sharp dropped the sword, turned away, and Teresa was smiling at him, offering him the bundle, and he began crying. He didn't know why, and he took his daughter into his arms and held her, kissed her, tasting the blood on her throat. She was his, a baby, a daughter, Antonia, crying, alive, and his. Epilogue They were married the next day by a priest who shook with fear because the city was still being sacked, and there were flames over the rooftops and screams in the streets. Sharp's men, those who'd come to the house, tidied up the courtyard and threw out the drunks. It seemed a strange place to be getting married. Clayton, Peters, and Guttridge guarded the main gate with loaded muskets. Acrid smoke drifted into the court, and Sharp didn't understand a word of the ceremony. Harper and Hogan, their faces, in Sharp's opinion, stupidly happy, looked on. A sergeant had whooped with joy when Sharp told him that he and Teresa would marry. Harper had thumped Sharp's back as if they were the same rank, and claimed that he and Isabella were very happy for them. Isabella? Oh, the wee girl, sir. She's still here. Sharp's back felt as if it had been struck by a French four-pounder. Harper blushed. I think she may want to stay on with me for a wee bit, you understand. That's if you don't mind, sir. Mind? <laughs> Why should I mind? But how the hell do you know? You don't speak Spanish, she doesn't speak English. Oh, a man can tell these things. Harper said the words mysteriously, as if Sharp would not understand. Then he smiled. Well, I'm glad you're doing the right thing, sir. So I am. Sharp had laughed. Who the hell are you to tell me what the right thing is? Harper shrugged. I'm the true faith, sir, so I am. I'll have to bring the wee one up a Catholic. I don't intend to bring the wee one up. Eh, that's true. That's women's work, sure enough. Oh, I don't mean that. He meant that Teresa would not stay with the army, nor he go to the hills, and so he would still be away from his child and his wife. Not for a while, but the time would come when she would leave, and he wondered if he was marrying only to give Antonia a name, a legitimacy, something he had never had himself. He was embarrassed by the ceremony, if a frightened priest standing among grinning soldiers constituted a ceremony, yet he felt a shy joy, was touched by pride because Teresa was beside him, and he supposed he loved her. Jane Gibbons was many miles and more impossibilities away. He listened to the words, felt awkward, and watched the happiness on Teresa's aunt's face. Man and wife, father of a child, captain of a company, and Sharp looked up past the trees into the wide sky where the kestrels hung. And then Teresa plucked his elbow, spoke something in Spanish, and he thought he knew what she'd said. He looked down at her, at the slim beauty, the dark, strong eyes, and he felt a terrible fool because Harper was grinning, just as Hogan and the company were grinning, and the girl Isabella was crying for happiness. Sharp smiled at his wife. I love you. He kissed her, remembering that first kiss beneath the lances, and it had led here. He smiled at the thought, because he was glad, and Teresa, happy that he was smiling, clutched his arm. 
I can uh, kiss the bride, Richard. Hogan beamed at them both, clasped Teresa, and planted a huge kiss on her that made Sharp's men cheer. The aunt clapped them, spoke in quick, fast Spanish at Sharp, and then brushed at the remains of dirt and blood on his uniform. Then Lieutenant Price insisted on kissing the bride, and the bride insisted on kissing Patrick Harper, and Sharp tried to hide his happiness, because he believed that to show an emotion, any emotion, was to expose a weakness. Here! Hogan held up a cup of wine. With the compliments of the bride's uncle, your health, Richard. It's a funny way to get married. Ah, oh, there are funny ways, whichever way you do it. Hogan beckoned to the servant who was holding Antonia, made the girl hold the baby up, and he trickled red wine into its mouth. There, my love, it's not every wee girl who gets to go to her parents' wedding. At least the child was well. The illness, whatever it was, had gone, and the doctors, thanking God because they had done nothing, said it was a malady that went with growing. They'd shrugged, pocketed their fee, and wondered why God spared the bastards. They left the city that afternoon, an armed group that could defend itself against the violence that still ravaged Barachov. The dead lay on the streets. They climbed out through the Santa Maria breach, and the ditch was still full, thick with bodies, so thick that heat came from the hundreds and hundreds of dead. Some men searched in the carnage, looking for brothers, sons, or friends. Others stood at the ditch's edge and wept for an army, as Wellington had wept when he stood on the glasses, and the great heap steamed in the April chill. Teresa, seeing the breaches for the first time, muttered in Spanish, and Sharp saw her eyes go up to the walls, to the silent guns, and he knew she was imagining their power. Colonel Wyndham was on the glasses, staring down to where his friend Collett had died, and he turned as Sharp and his party climbed the ladders from the ditch. Sharp? Sir. Wyndham saluted him, strangely formal amongst so much death. You're a brave man, Sharp. Sharp was embarrassed. He shrugged. Thank you. I knew, sir. I saw the attack. We stopped, out of words, and then remembered the portrait. He took it from inside his jacket and handed over the wrinkled, stained picture of the colonel's wife. I thought you liked this, sir. Wyndham looked at it, turned it over, back again, and then looked at Sharp. How on earth did you find it? It was in the hat, sir, of a man called Obadiah Hakeswill, who stole it. He uh, also stole my telescope. The glass had been in Hakeswill's haversack and was now in Sharp's. He jerked her head towards Harper, standing with Isabella. Sergeant Harper, sir, did not steal a thing. Wyndham nodded. The breeze tugged at the tassel on his hat. You've given him back his sergeancy? The colonel smiled in resignation. Yes, sir. And I'll give him his rifle and green jacket next, if you have no objection. Oh, no, Sharp. Well, the company's yours. Wyndham smiled briefly at Sharp, perhaps remembering the conversations about humility, and then looked at Harper. Sergeant. Sir. Harper stepped forward, stood to attention. I uh, owe you an apology. Wyndham was obviously embarrassed deeply by the need to speak so to a sergeant. No apology needed, sir. Harper's face was straight, his bearing formal. A straight bark is very attractive to the lady, sir. Blood and hounds. Wyndham was relieved to be off the hook. He nodded at Sharp. Carry on, Captain Sharp. They walked back to the camp, leaving the stench of the dead behind them, and the sounds of the city faded as they walked. They passed the trenches and the batteries, and Sharp saw where a gunner had planted spring flowers on a parapet. The weather was turning, warming to a dry summer, and he knew that the army would be marching soon, north and east, going into the heart of Spain. Barajoz was done. That night, two miles down the Seville Road, a twitching figure scrabbled down beneath a field marker, muttering to himself, knowing he could not be killed, and pulled out the oilcloth bundle of stolen goods. Hexwell was deserting. He knew he couldn't go back. There was a witness to the death of Knowles. The portrait had been in the sergeant's hat, and he understood that only a firing squad awaited him. He sniffed the night air and was not worried. He'd go somewhere and find something and this wasn't the first night that he'd been utterly alone, homeless, and his dark shape loped into the night, seeking mischief. A man went into a breach for one thing only, pride, and Sharp had been there.
He had stood at the top of a breach, fear defeated, and gone down into a horror that tarnished victory as blood tarnished a sword. He lay awake and thought of streets running with wine, silver, madness, and blood. He had hoped for so much, for a captaincy, for revenge on a clerk, for a company, for a woman he loved, and a child he'd never seen. And the hopes had been won at Badajoz. He lay in Loire's tent, its owner in hospital with a terrible wound. The night was quiet, dark, silent for the first time in weeks, and a great victory had been won. The gates of Spain had been burst open. He looked at his woman, beautiful in the firelight that seeped through the canvas, and he marveled that he was married. Then he looked at the child, dark hair and snub nose that slept between them, and the love welled up incomprehensible, uncontrollable. He kissed his daughter, Antonia, and in the flame light she seemed terribly small and vulnerable. Yet she was alive, and his, his only relative by blood. She was his, to be protected as he must protect all those other souls who liked him, were proud of him, and proud to be in his ranks. Sharp's Company Historical Note on the morning of the 7th of April, 1812, Philippon and the survivors of the city garrison surrendered in the fort of San Cristobal, thus sealing one of the British Army's most famous victories, the storming of Badajoz. The next day, around midday, Wellington ordered a gallows erected in the plaza by the cathedral, and, though there's no evidence that the gallows were used, the threat was sufficient to bring order to the city's streets. Thus ended one of the British Army's most notorious episodes, the sack of Badajoz. I've tried in this story to offer some reasons why the sack was so pitiless. The rules of war condoned it, and the instincts of soldiers who had survived such a horrific fight demanded it. Those soldiers also suspected, with some justification, that the inhabitants of Badajoz were pro-French. None of this, perhaps, excuses their behaviour. Many of the soldiers who ransacked the city had taken no part in the assault, but they were reason enough for the ordinary soldier on that climactic April night. Some historians suggest diffidently that Wellington allowed the sack, and let it continue beyond the first day, as a warning to other towns that harboured French garrisons. If true, the warning didn't work, as the British were to discover one year later at San Sebastian. The fight there was just as hard, and the sack afterwards just as horrific. The sack of Barajoz was not without one famous love story. A lieutenant of the 95th Rifles, Harry Smith, met and married a fourteen-year-old Spanish girl, Juana Maria de los Dolores de Leon, who was fleeing from the horror. She was not completely unscathed. Her earrings had been torn bloodily from her lobes, but Lieutenant Smith found and protected her. Years later, after her husband had been knighted, a town was named after her in South Africa that was itself to see a famous siege, Lady Smith. I tried to be faithful to the events of the campaign, Thus, for instance, the guns sunk into the wall at Ciudad Rodrigo existed, and the story of the Nottinghamshire battalion charging across the planks is true. Each battle described in the story happened, though the attack on the dam was not made of battalion strength, nor was it made as early in the siege. It happened on the 2nd of April, under the command of Lieutenant Stanway of the Engineers, who, like the unfortunate Fitchett, failed to take enough powder, and so the explosion miscarried. On the morning of the 7th of April, beneath the breaches, there was found a mass of bodies still warm, and observers guessed their number at twelve or thirteen hundred dead. Wellington wept at the sight. Many historians have blamed him for attacking too soon, though, given the pressures on him and his lack of a proper engineering train, his decision is difficult to criticise. Hindsight is a great general. Barakhov was won by sheer bravery. Bravery like that of Lieutenant Colonel Ridge of the 5th Fusiliers, whose exploits I borrowed and gave to Captain Robert Knowles. Ridge died, shot at the end of the fight, and Napier gave him a famous epitaph. And no man died that night with greater glory, yet many died, and there was much glory. The novel does not do justice to the 5th Division, whose attack on the San Vincente Bastion, made late, was most responsible for the city's fall. There was no forlorn hope on the third, the central breach, and accounts of the night differ as to whether any man even reached that breach. 
The Light Division claimed that some of their dead were found on its slopes, but most survivors disagree, and so, with a novelist's freedom, I took the breach for Sharp. There was one final attack on the breaches, which succeeded, but Wellington did not order it and said he was certain that the 5th Division were in the defenders' rear. Purists will also be offended that Sharp attacked Ciudad Rodrigo with the 3rd Division and Barajov with the 4th, but it is the fate of fictional soldiers to be always where the fight is thickest, even when that means a cavalier disregard for the make-up of divisions. Some battalions were involved in both assaults, notably those of the 3rd and Light Divisions, so my sin is not too great. I've tried to be exact, with the above exceptions, to the real events. The letters and diaries of the campaign are, as ever, a trove of information. Thus, for instance, the details in the book of the daily weather conditions are taken from the diaries, and I feel a constant debt to those long-dead soldiers whose memories I plunder. One myth should be put to rest. Barakhov was not assaulted on Easter Sunday. The 6th of April was the second Monday after Easter in 1812, and no amount of imagination can change that fact. The castle walls of Balakhov are unchanged. The only addition to the scenery is a road that passes at the foot of the castle hill. The breaches in the two bastions have been repaired, and the giant ditch is now a municipal garden. The glacis is entirely gone. The approaches to the breaches, like the San Miguel Hill, have been built over. The approach to the Trinidad is hidden by nondescript buildings, and that to the Santa Maria by a modern and remarkably ugly bullring. The area of the central breach is still a passage through the walls, the defences between the two bastions being largely destroyed. But it is possible to climb to the bastion's parapets and into the embrasures and marvel at the courage of men who would attack such a place. Ciudad Rodrigo's defences are better preserved. The breach repairs are visible above the glasses, and the marks of British cannonballs are still chipped into the church tower. The fort of San Cristobal, across the river from Balajov, is in almost perfect repair. The South Essex could march in tomorrow and have it set up for defence within an hour. Best preserved of all are the defences of Elvis, just across the border, and all are worth visiting. The memorial plaques in the Trinidad Bastion, where the Madrid Road enters Barajov, recall the assault and sack of the city, but not that of the 6th of April 1812. They remember the 14th of August 1936, and some inhabitants still remember the massacre which followed the assault by Franco's troops. History has a sad way of repeating itself in Barajov. It is not a pretty city. Some people have described it as gloomy, as if the ghosts of too many battles stalk the streets, but I did not find it so. As in other places in Portugal and Spain, I met with much kindness and courtesy, and was given every help with my researches. The last words in this book can be left for the man who became accustomed to having the last word, Wellington. Writing to the war minister, and talking of his five thousand casualties, he said, The capture of Barajov affords as strong an instance of the gallantry of our troops as has ever been displayed, but I greatly hope that I shall never again be the instrument of putting them to such a test.